You ever think about how most of Stanley Kubrick's movies were adaptations? I do. I think about it a lot. I think about it so much that I spent the last year reading every novel Kubrick ever adapted and then watching his film immediately after. Despite theoretically relying on other people's material, which ranged from highbrow literature to forgotten oddities to pure pulp, Kubrick's signature voice always comes through, and that makes the man ripe from an adaptation studies perspective. How did Kubrick transform the written word to cinema? This video will be a chronological overview and analysis of Kubrick's filmography, with a specific emphasis on how each text was adapted from its source novel. My goal is to understand how Kubrick approached adaptation at both a narrative and formal level, as well as explore the major thematic preoccupations that dominate the man's films. I'm especially interested in how major themes arise from, and sometimes in defiance of, the source material. I'll also be discussing plot details at length, so if you're weary of spoilers, I'd recommend using the timestamps in the description. Otherwise, sit back, relax, and join me for a deep dive into Kubrick's books, The Adaptations of Stanley Kubrick. Adapted from Lionel White's 1955 novel Clean Break, the Killing is a hard-boiled noir heist film about an ex-con and his elaborate scheme to rob a horse track. Kubrick remains largely faithful to White's book. The basic narrative and the characters have seen only minimal alterations, and the film also retains White's non-linear structure, observing both the planning and execution of the heist from different perspectives. This was the element that most attracted Kubrick to the project, and it shows. The central heist in particular, depicted repeatedly from each player's vantage point. We see a door open, and Johnny enter it 56 minutes in, and then George opening that door from the other side 10 minutes later. Nikki kills the racehorse at the 62 minute mark, and 4 minutes later, we hear the announcer again describe the chaos of the killing, as Johnny prepares to rob the back room. Most of the changes made were to simplify the story. For instance, in the novel, George's wife Sherry has affairs with Val, Johnny, and Randy. In the movie, she only cheats with Val. Kubrick also adds unique aesthetic flourishes, particularly in the robbery. While in the novel, Johnny hides his face with a handkerchief, the movie uses this creepy clown mask. This change not only adds a more distinct aesthetic flair to the robbery, it also suggests the entire heist is a tragic farce. But to really understand the significance of this adaptation, it's important to step back and take a look at the movies Kubrick made before the killing. Kubrick cut his teeth on two self-funded features, the allegorical war picture Fear and Desire and the film noir Killer's Kiss. Understanding these movies, which were not adaptations but original screenplays, is key to understanding why a pulpy genre exercise like The Killing was such a seismic leap for its young director. Kubrick himself considered these films more like apprenticeships where he could learn the fundamentals of filmmaking, rather than particularly successful works in their own right. Both are rather unambiguously amateur movies made with minimal resources and a lack of refinement, though there are glimmers of Kubrick's raw talent. Kubrick's background as a still photographer is evident in the dramatic compositions and striking lighting. Killer's Kiss, in particular, has some beautiful imagery, with its thick layer of noir atmosphere and rich sense of urban life in New York. Fear and Desire shows more technical limitations, but is also narratively far more ambitious, a metaphysical war movie, not about any one conflict, but more a rumination on war as an abstract concept and illogical aspect of the human condition. It's not clear where the story is set, and no effort is made to suggest what either side is fighting for. Indeed, the enemy is largely unseen, save for in brief glimpses, such as in the dinner slaughter, where the victims are played by the same actors who commit the killing, creating the impression of war as a self-destructive human impulse. Killer's Kiss is less esoteric and more commercial, 
but it too is loaded with symbolic meaning. Such as in the climax, where hero and villain fighting over possession of a woman is set in a warehouse full of mannequins. As James Nearmore notes, the mise-en-scene directly comments on the ways in which women's bodies are fragmented into individual parts and fetishized. Where both of these movies begin to falter is in their stories. For all its thoughtful ambitions, Fear and Desire is largely structureless, rambling from one event to the next with little sense of progression or character. Killer's Kiss's placement within genre tropes does give the story much more shape. Characters actually have motivation, and the movie has a clear beginning, middle, and end. But it's also the barest outline of a noir plot. Guy meets girl, girl is involved with no good hoods, guy saves girl. Scenes like the mannequin fight imply a greater complexity, but these are isolated moments that don't cohere into a thematically full story. And while the characters have motivation, they don't really have much else going for them. Frank Silvera's villain is creepy and insecure, but protagonists Davy and Gloria are totally lacking in interiority or personality. It's not surprising that all of the film's best scenes are the dialogue-free mood pieces. Once these two start talking, Killer's Kiss slows to a crawl. This is what makes Kubrick's shift to adaptations so significant. While the larger budgets and professional crew made for a much more technically proficient film than Fear and Desire or Killer's Kiss, the real advantage The Killing provided was a foundation for Kubrick. White's novel readily offered a layered plot, one whose nonlinear structure loaned itself well to cinematic form, where editing can control the flow of time. And while the characters are all fairly basic archetypes, the grizzled old gangster, the femme fatale, the hapless sap, they nonetheless brought identifiable personalities, something Kubrick leaned into by casting crime and noir regulars in the principal roles. Adaptation gave Kubrick a basis to work from, and in the case of Clean Break, that meant a tightly wound plotline with a roster of hardened characters. Which is not to suggest all of the killing's strengths are merely translated over from its source material. For starters, the dialogue has been completely reworked. Lionel White's prose is blunt and unsophisticated, so Kubrick enlisted the crime novelist Jim Thompson to write the film's dialogue. Lines like, George may be a fool, in fact he is, but he's no liar, become You've never been a liar, George. You don't have enough imagination to lie. We'll bring this bastard around and find out what this is all about. Becomes... You're a joke, clown! Come on, clown, sing us a chorus from Pagliacci. You better talk, George. Come clean. Either you talk or we'll get it out of her. Conversations function as exposition, but also crackle with life and energy. As exciting as the exchange of gunfire. The story also gains a lot aesthetically in being adapted to a cinematic form. Particularly noteworthy is the single source lighting. The smoke-filled rooms cast in so much darkness, they transform into abstractions of physical space. There's also the added thrill of actually seeing the robbery play out before your eyes. Though at other points, the film elides much of the violence present in the novel. When Val attempts to rob the gang after the heist, White describes the ensuing shootout in graphic detail. Val getting clipped in the throat, blood pouring down his shirt, Jimmy shooting Marvin and George. But in the film, all we see is George shoot Val. The chaotic sounds of gunfire imply a massacre, but it's only after everyone has been killed that a new angle reveals the outcome. But the most profound change made in adaptation was to the ending which reverberates through the whole of the killing. In the novel, Johnny is on the cusp of escaping with the loot when George kills him in a jealous rage for his affair with Sherry. The final page describes a blood-soaked newspaper under Johnny's corpse, which reads, Racetrack Bandit makes clean break with two million. The film also ends with the ultimate failure of the plan, but Johnny is not killed. Instead, his suitcase, which holds the loot, is to be placed in luggage, 
when a sharp turn knocks the bag over and loose bills are swept away by propeller blades, as Johnny powerlessly looks on. Here, we see both White and Kubrick taking advantage of their respective forms, to impart the collapse of an elaborate plan. On a deeper level, though, these two endings reflect very different thematic interests. Clean Break is ultimately a pretty standard crime yarn of a tricky dame who brings ruin to the men around her. Sherry's involvement is what causes Johnny's foolproof plan to fail. It's her lover Val that massacres most of Johnny's gang, and it's her affair with Johnny which motivates George to murder in the book's closing moments. In fact, the whole book is loaded with misogyny. Multiple characters describe a woman in their life as a tramp, Val horribly beats Sherry to the indifference of his criminal partner, Mike abhors his young daughter's loose and sinful lifestyle. Misogyny is a running motif in the book, whose plot overtly positions Sherry as the chaotic agent which undoes Johnny's carefully laid plans. Most of this is reduced in the killing. Sherry is still duplicitous, but the overarching resentment of women has been removed. What's more, while Sherry still complicates the heist by involving Val, who in turn is responsible for the shootout which kills most of the gang, she's only a small factor in why Johnny's plan fails. Unlike the novel, where the actual robbery goes off without a hitch, Kubrick emphasizes a multitude of failures from the start. Gunman Nicky is killed when trying to flee the scene. Despite creating a diversion, Johnny is immediately spotted entering the back room, and narrowly escapes at gunpoint on his way out. Johnny is late picking up the money from the hotel, and almost enters the wrong room by mistake. Kubrick finds an understated humor in these failures, as in this shot, where Johnny struggles to fit all the money in this flimsy suitcase. Or in the film's final moments, where after Johnny has lost all the money, he can't even hail a cab to escape the cops. Failure does not come from a villain working against Johnny's efforts, but more abstract forces. For all Johnny's intricate planning and attention to detail, he does not prepare for every contingency. He doesn't account for the security guard taking a special interest in Nikki, which ultimately leads to his death, or that the rest of his partners would be taken out, and Johnny would need to pack all the cash in his measly suitcase or that the suitcase would be so big, the airport staff won't allow Johnny to carry it onto the flight. These small errors finally come to a boil at the runway, when a sharp turn from the baggage cart causes the suitcase to fall, and those loose locks finally give way. For how could anyone have accounted for the myriad errors which led to this overstuffed suitcase to be placed in baggage, or that a tiny dog would cause the baggage driver to swerve and the case to fall. Where the novel is about treachery and betrayal, Kubrick's film is about the illusion of total control within complex systems. Johnny Clay is so thorough in his planning, and the movie takes time to examine that care. The first half of the killing is all about laying out the details of the heist, with the narration stressing the exact time down to the minute, emphasizing every piece of the job from every perspective. And all this careful planning slowly but surely deteriorates from a series of simple yet unaccounted for variables. Hayden Guest compares Johnny to Kubrick himself, both men operating with machine-like precision. Johnny even delegates roles in his heist the same way a filmmaker does the roles of a production, multiple people working separately and with different levels of involvement towards the same goal. And what is Kubrick famous for if not his perfectionism, an all-encompassing sense of control? Virtually everyone who has written anything about Kubrick has talked about his obsessive character, his dominance over every aspect of his films, from the development of the screenplay, through to the editing, and even marketing, few directors embody such a degree of auteurist control. With that in mind, The Killing becomes more than just a skillfully made heist movie, but a dramatization of Kubrick's worst anxieties, the best laid plans crumbling right before his eyes. Concepts like systemic failure and the collapse of control are themes Kubrick would return to in greater depth with future movies, 
but there's a special poignancy to the killing given Kubrick was coming off the unsatisfying productions of Fear and Desire and Killer's Kiss. These were movies Kubrick technically had complete authority over, serving not just as director, but also producer, writer, cinematographer, editor, and sound designer. And despite complete control across multiple aspects of production, Kubrick was unsatisfied. At best, he saw the films as stepping stones for learning his craft. At worst, as embarrassments he disowned and seldom discussed. With The Killing, Kubrick told the story of a man not unlike himself, someone who was precise and organized, yet still failed to achieve his goals. Whether he intended it or not, The Killing became an exercise in facing a loss of control, and possibly a means to come to grips with his past failures. I find it very telling that, unlike in the book, Johnny Clay is not killed at the end, but reluctantly accepts his failure and moves on. Defeated, but not destroyed. Conventional wisdom would see the ending as a variation on the theme that crime doesn't pay. But given Kubrick's own comments that the true meaning of the Icarus myth was build better wings, perhaps the message of the killing is plan a little more carefully. As with The Killing, Kubrick is largely faithful to the broad strokes of Humphrey Cobb's novel. In the thick of World War I, French generals order an attack on a well-defended German position which ends in disaster, most men barely even able to leave their trenches. Enraged, General Moreau orders one man from each company tried for cowardice, where if found guilty, they will be executed by firing squad. There are several modest alterations in character names, and most of the dialogue has been rewritten, but the most profound change made is the dramatic expansion of Colonel Dax. In the novel, Dax is a relatively minor character, an officer who fights to spare the accused, but is largely absent from the rest of the story, which is really more of an ensemble piece about the event itself and the legal process without a clearly defined main character. In the film, Dax is unambiguously the lead, the legal defense for the accused, and a company leader in the ill-fated mission to take the hill. The character is also imbued with a movie star's grandeur, Kirk Douglas playing Dax as the single source of virtue in this godless war, a hero who makes it his mission to save the boys from a cruel fate. Cobb's novel has little use for heroic gestures. In the book, Dax is merely a good officer who does his best to spare the men, and who leaves the story when the men are found guilty. Similarly, the book actually has a fourth commander the film omits, who, when instructed to select a man to be tried for cowardice, simply refuses. Though motivated by saving lives, the commander's success is a byproduct of maneuvering military bureaucracy rather than taking an ideological stance. Both the novel and film capture Hannah Arendt's concept of the banality of evil. The generals ordering men to their deaths are not villainous sadists, but mundane people motivated by duty and professional advancement. But the novel also captures what might be called the banality of good, where the closest thing to heroism is just men either doing their jobs or ignoring them. The film presents a more traditional heroic leading man and the overall structure owes as much to Frank Capra as Cobb. Like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, this is a story of a good man fighting injustice, embodied by a villain opposing the hero. But unlike Mr. Smith, Dax fails. As in the novel, the men are found guilty, and while the movie adds a subplot of Dax working to save them after the trial, it amounts to nothing, and the three are still killed. Dax's efforts are no different from the condemned Private Pierre's thrashing in his holding cell. Futile efforts that can't stop the firing squad. Rather than dulling the novel's anti-war sentiment, the melodramatic transformation of Dax's character makes the execution all the more painful. The film's Hollywood structure suggests the possibility of a Hollywood outcome, 
but Kubrick is faithful, not just to Cobb's writing, but to World War I as a fundamentally meaningless conflict. That futility is also captured in Kubrick's visual style, particularly in the battle scenes. Where Paths of Glory lacks the same graphic violence found in the novel, it captures the horrors of war through cinematic technique. Particularly poignant is the charge on the hill, where a series of tracking shots follow the troops storming through gunfire and explosions. Waves of undefined men sent to die on a seemingly never-ending trek through a barren battlefield. After a few minutes of action, a zoom into a tight close-up on Dax brings attention to a singular point, and an eyeline match emphasizes the vast distance between the men and their target, showing just how little progress has been made, as men continue to charge into their graves. Elsewhere, tracking shots barrel through the trenches, capturing rows of men awaiting their death, while wide-angle lenses distort features and give the otherwise realistic environments an air of the grotesque. Ultimately though, the film adaptation is less interested in the battlefield than in the plotting of war, omitting much of the scenes with soldiers to instead focus on military authority. Here, Kubrick adds a class-based dimension absent in the novel, by drawing a more profound contrast between the generals controlling the war and the soldiers on the front lines. Bunkers are shot with the same single source lighting as the killing, hardened and dirty faces obscured by a thick darkness. The chateau where the generals meet, however, is elegant and beautiful, a palace bathed in bright light. Where the trenches carry the faint sounds of gunfire and explosions in the distance, the echoey halls of the chateau stress just how vast the setting is, a kingdom squared away from the brutality of war. What better way to illustrate the different worlds of the grunts and the generals than by placing them in different genres? The former, in addition to being in a combat movie, are in a film noir, with chiaroscuro lighting and the specter of doom haunting each frame. But the generals are in an opulent costume drama, complete with a glamorous ballroom scene and prestigious symbols of wealth that echo the works of Max Ophels more than they do a war epic. Men in the trenches carry the corpses of their fallen brothers. Men at the chateau carry paintings, which denote sophistication and beauty. Men in the trenches risk dying. Men at the chateau risk breaking social customs. This sense of two discrete worlds becomes especially poignant in light of the execution. As Philippe, Pierre, and Maurice are marched towards the firing squad, the chateau looms large in the background. You can see it in almost every shot of the scene, with James Nairmour noting its visual presence a reflection of Walter Benjamin's theory that every achievement of advanced civilization is also a monument to barbarism. This idea is further reinforced by the film cutting immediately from the execution to the generals surrounded by grand beauties of art and decadence, eating deliciously as they discuss how well the men died. This, and everything that comes after, are additions to the source material. Cobb's novel ends sharply at the execution. The final page describes the squad firing and then details how each body reacts to the gunfire. Sergeant Major Boulanger then walks man to man, pistol in hand, execution style headshots, finishing things as mercifully and as dignified as possible under the circumstances. A fitting end to a novel that begins by discussing the horror war brings for the men who fight it. But Kubrick's film doesn't begin with the horrors of war. It begins with ironic dissonance. Voiceover dryly informs us of battle, while a panning camera reveals an elegant manner, which could not feel further removed from the grisly trench warfare described on the soundtrack. We then move inside the comforts of the chateau. Well, this is splendid. Superb! Well, I've tried to create a pleasant atmosphere in which to work. As General Brulair persuades Miro to sacrifice his men for the chance at career advancement. 
It's only natural Kubrick brings us back to these very concepts at the end. If Cobb's novel was a tragic examination of how lives are sacrificed to an inhuman war machine, Kubrick's film is a rumination on class difference. To France. Even the seemingly melodramatic addition of Dax's last-minute efforts to save the accused is tinged with class consciousness. Dax tries to use social pressures to push General Brûleur into sparing the men, but this fails, with Brûleur instead assuming Dax was simply gunning for Miro's job, and genuinely dumbfounded, his efforts were instead to save lives, as if the lives of the lower rank aren't worth considering beyond how they might function as tools for the ruling class. In some respects, this conflict runs antithetical to Kubrick's recurring thematic occupations. Kubrick's producer and brother-in-law, Jan Harlan, has said the common theme in Kubrick's work is human folly, how human beings are governed by emotional impulses rather than intellect, and the self-destruction those impulses bring. But in Passive Glory, it's the villains who are governed by a pure intellect, capable of rationalizing mass slaughter and senseless execution with a pleasant smile. Then again, in other ways, the film is classic Kubrick, a story of men hopelessly struggling for control in an environment which grants them none, destined to fail tragically. What is undeniably atypical of Kubrick, however, is the film's sentimental ending where the emotional performance of a German folk song drives the French troops to tears. This might seem a maudlin touch, which spits in the face of Cobb's stark pessimism. Remember, the novel ends immediately following the execution. The final line reads, The next shot went into a brain which was already dead. It is a callous expression of life's end, a human being reduced to inanimate muscle and tissue. But perhaps more brutal than the matter-of-fact description is the lack of closure. The story may functionally be over, but to end so abruptly after the execution is to deny the reader time to process what has happened. Kubrick's epilogue with the German singer offers not feel-good sentiment to undercut the story's disdain for military authority, but a primal moment of emotional release. After enduring the hopeless death march on the anthill and the insidious bureaucracy which condemned innocent men to die, the audience is given time to mourn. It's not much. They want us to move back to the front immediately. I'll give the men a few minutes more, Sergeant. Yes, sir. But it's enough of a reprieve to provide an emotional context. For a director so often described as cold and calculating, this ending is a remarkable expression of shared humanity. And now we come to the anomaly. Spartacus is often skipped over by Kubrick scholars, not because it's bad, but because it's barely a Kubrick movie. On all his other films, Kubrick oversaw all aspects of production, from the initial inception of an idea and development of the story, right up to the final touches in editing. Spartacus was a work-for-hire job. The project originated with Kirk Douglas, bitter he was passed over for the role of Ben-Hur. Like Dave Mustaine after being kicked out of Metallica, Douglas vowed he'd make his own historical epic, and his would rock even harder than William Wyler's. It was Douglas as producer who chose to adapt Howard Fast's novel, Douglas who enlisted the blacklisted Dalton Trumbo to write the screenplay, Douglas who cast the film. Kubrick wasn't even the first director on Spartacus. Western maestro Anthony Mann shot for about a week before being fired by Douglas. By the time Kubrick joined production, the story and characters were more or less locked down. Even the picture's visual aesthetic and tone had been set in the opening sequence Man had shot in Death Valley. Kubrick himself found Trumbo's script melodramatic and silly, 
lamenting the fact that the titular hero was presented as faultless and without complexity. Douglas even claims that Kubrick tried to scrap the iconic I'm Spartacus scene, considering it twee and overly sentimental. That's not to say Kubrick had no creative input on Spartacus. The man took an especially intense interest in the film's cinematography, and while he had to work faster than he liked, Kubrick still does inject a visual richness in his lighting and camera movement. There are flourishes in perspective too, like when Spartacus and Draba await their battle in the gladiatorial arena, glimpsing their fate through wooden bars. <laughs> Overall though, it would be fair to say Spartacus is not a Kubrick adaptation to the same extent his other films were. Frankly, it's unclear if Kubrick even read Fast Novel. But the ways in which the film differs from the book still make Spartacus worth discussing, as the alterations are profound. The film adaptation of Spartacus largely adheres to the narrative conventions of the historical epic. Though lacking the overtly biblical elements of Ben-Hur or the Ten Commandments, the movie still tells a linear story of a downtrodden and virtuous hero fighting a corrupt authority. It's a heroic adventure, with lots of action and scenes of bravery, as well as romance and dastardly villains. The book, meanwhile, more closely resembles Citizen Kane than any roadshow epic. Fast Story begins after Spartacus's rebellion has been crushed by the Roman Empire, with rebel bodies strewn up on crucifixes and Caius remarking that the body of Spartacus was never found. There are flashbacks to the war, but the narrative thrust of the novel is not the rebellion itself, it's the mystery of how a powerless slave jeopardized the foundations of Roman society. Spartacus becomes an enigmatic figure to be puzzled and obsessed over. This accounts for the film's simplistic characterization of Spartacus, because he isn't actually the novel's protagonist, or even observed directly. At all times, he is only glimpsed, either through those that knew him, or those familiar with the legend. That the story begins after Spartacus has already become a martyr only further adds to his mythic aura. The irony at the core of the novel is that for as mysterious and legendary as Spartacus has become, his wife Verinia insists that he was in fact a plain and ordinary man. This is a contradiction Crassus simply cannot comprehend. After successfully crushing Spartacus's rebellion, General Crassus becomes fixated on understanding the enemy he never actually met. He buys Verinia as a slave specifically to try and aspire to the indefinable greatness he senses Spartacus had. Many of these details are present in the film, but the reframing removes emphasis. Gone is the nonlinear structure, and characters reflecting on the implications of the slave rebellion. Crassus still buys Verinia, but does so near the beginning of the story from pure attraction to her rather than an obsession with Spartacus. The film even adds a face-to-face -face meeting between hero and villain, Spartacus, a dramatic resolution which runs antithetical to the novel, where the whole point is that Spartacus is an enemy Crassus cannot comprehend. At the heart of these changes is a shift in focus. Where the film is concerned with the success or failure of Spartacus's slave revolt, the novel examines how Rome reacts to a challenge against its social hierarchy. Fast largely takes up the perspective of the ruling class, because his book is concerned with a society coming to grips with the fact that it is built on a foundation of slavery. That the decadence and wealth of the rich are precariously maintained through the exploitation of an underclass. Long passages are devoted to examining the ways in which the idle ruling class are disconnected from the labor which sustains Rome. None more cutting or succinct as when the philosopher Cicero states, we are the unique products of slaves and slavery. This is what makes us Romans, if you come right down to it. 
our host lives on this great plantation by the grace of a thousand slaves. Spartacus's rebellion is dangerous for Rome's ruling class, not merely because it inspires future acts of defiance, but also for revealing so plainly how little the ruling class actually contributes. Many characters of wealth and affluence share a feeling of hollowness in realizing how idle and boring their existence is, enjoying the fruits of others' labor without actually building or maintaining anything themselves. This disconnect is what fuels Crassus's obsession with Spartacus and Varinia, Crassus bewildered that his purchasing of Varinia and ownership over her cannot also buy her love. If all this sounds a bit communist-influenced, that's not a coincidence. Fast was indeed a blacklisted communist, who began writing Spartacus while serving time in prison, and had to self-publish the novel in 1951, the book finding great success within leftist circles. The book is a communist parable. The villains are defined as such precisely because they live off the exploited labor of others, while the rebels explicitly organize without a hierarchical power system and share equally in all rewards. Were there any doubt of the historical novel's connection to contemporary politics, Fast ends on the line, And so long as men labored, and other men took and used the fruit of those who labored, the name of Spartacus would be remembered, whispered sometimes, and shouted loud and clear at others. Such subtext is still detectable in the adaptation, but at the margins. Screenwriter Dalton Trumbo was also a target of the Blacklist, and though he does address the Red Scare of the 1950s, he does so cautiously. First in the I'm Spartacus scene, where the act of refusing to name names is just and heroic. And again in this line from Crassus. Lists of the disloyal have been compiled a direct dig at Senator Joseph McCarthy's efforts to identify and expose communist threats. Notice, though, that while Trumbo's script does valorize refusing to testify and condemns McCarthy's blacklist, it does so without evoking political ideology and communist values. The focus is on a more general sense of injustice and corruption, rather than anything relating to class or labor. There are a couple of visual depictions of class warfare, notably in the God's Eye point of view, which positions Crassus above the gladiatorial pit where slaves fight and die for the ruling class's amusement. Contrast is also drawn from the lush palaces where the nobles live against the harsh conditions of slaves, but it's far less pointed than in the novel, or even than Paths of Glory. Where the novel explicitly positions Spartacus and his followers as a political revolution who seek to overthrow the reigning government, the film sees the group trying to escape Rome by sea. All we want is to get out of this damn country! Only turning to warfare in self-defense against Rome's armies. The film also makes a point to contextualize its conflicts in the long distant past. In the last century before the birth of the new faith called Christianity, which was destined to overthrow the pagan tyranny of Rome and bring about a new society. More than just establishing a time period, this voiceover separates the Roman Empire depicted on screen from the modern Christian America for seeing the film in 1960. The audience is rather bluntly being instructed not to notice any parallels. This is in sharp contrast to the book, which ends with a sign-off, New York City, 1951. That all but screams the socio-political conflicts of the story are highly relevant to contemporary audiences. And even though the core story of Spartacus is still structured around an oppressive ruling class leeching off slave labor, the film also recasts the tale as a cosplay of the American Revolution, with a cast of American heroes fighting for freedom against scheming British overlords. In sum, Spartacus Hollywoodized its source material, sanding off rougher political edges for a nicer and more palatable piece of escapism. And it worked. The film proved an enormous critical and financial hit, 
the first unconditional success of Kubrick's career. Spartacus is still held in high esteem, generally regarded as among the best and most sophisticated of the roadshow historical epics, and a high point for almost everyone involved. Everyone except the director. For Kubrick, Spartacus was a frustrating compromise, yet its success also gave the filmmaker newfound opportunity. Never again would Kubrick relinquish so much control to a producer, or conform so fully to the conventions of commercial narrative, or feature an uncomplicated hero as protagonist. And with his next adaptation, Kubrick would make the anti-Spartacus. No, I'm Spartacus. You come to free the slaves or something? Yeah, yeah. How did they ever make a movie of Lolita? So went the tagline for Kubrick's sixth feature, an adaptation of Vladimir Nabokov's controversial novel of the same name. The line was no doubt meant to stress the salacious nature of the material, that Hollywood had the gall to adapt a book about the love affair between a grown adult and a teen girl. An effective bit of marketing, if somewhat misleading. Kubrick had in fact anticipated the difficulties of adapting the sexually explicit novel for Hayes-era Hollywood, and worked closely with the censors at the scripting phase. The few kisses are, as described by Richard Corliss, as chaste as Carmelite's lips, and while the sexual dalliances between Humbert and Lolita are not strictly speaking ambiguous, they're also never depicted on screen or made overt in dialogue. This is in sharp contrast to the novel, which fixates much more on the physical relationship between the characters, albeit without graphic detail, and even addresses the pain that sex with Humbert causes Lolita. In the film, the perverse nature of the affair, and the story as a whole, is rendered more through suggestive innuendo and visual metaphors. Not strictly hidden, but not overt either. Sure enough, while Lolita did find some resistance from censorship boards, the film was ultimately released with minimal objection, all things considered. The real challenge in making a movie of Lolita is not the lurid subject matter, but the style. Apart from a brief foreword, the entirety of Nabokov's novel is a first-person account from English professor Humbert Humbert as he details his attractions to nymphettes prepubescent girls between ages 9 and 14, his cross-country romance with American teenager Dolores Hayes, whom he nicknames Lolita, and his eventual murder of playwright Claire Quilty in revenge for stealing Lolita away from him. All of this is presented as a memoir, written by Humbert in prison as he awaits trial for his crimes. That subjectivity fundamentally shapes the narrative. Nabokov's writing less about what happened between Humbert and Lolita, but more how Humbert remembers and interprets those events. The reader is forced to take Humbert's word when he claims that it was Lolita who did the seducing, or when he describes a romantic moment he and Lolita supposedly shared. As Monica Reed notes, Nabokov's writing style replicates Lolita's actual situation, that of a person silenced and forced to become what her captor perceives, her true self buried beneath this imposed facade. Nonetheless, glimmers of this true self can be read between the lines, moments where Humbert slips he was bribing Lolita for sex, or that Lolita was perpetually miserable during their time together. The most telling glimpse of Dolores, not as nymphid dream, but abused child, comes at the tail end of the book's first half. Following the revelation that her mother is dead, chapter 33 is a sparse description of Humbert buying Lolita gifts and securing a hotel for the night, before concluding, At the hotel, we had separate rooms, but in the middle of the night, she came sobbing into mine, and we made it up very gently. You see, she had absolutely nowhere else to go. But while the novelist can parse a narrative from the perspective of its protagonist, the filmmaker can't, or at least not to the same degree. 
As Kubrick himself said, films need to deal with objective reality. The events of a story are not merely described to a viewer, but shown, captured in vivid detail by the camera. How then does a first-person account translate to a cinematic medium? One trick Kubrick pulls is to tilt his formal choices so they align with how Humbert perceives what's happening, particularly the cinematography. Kubrick utilizes soft lighting and lenses which give the image a glossy sheen. Coupled with the delicate score of the title sequence and the swooning music in the two pivotal goodbye scenes, the aesthetics of the film resemble a romantic melodrama. Kubrick even tones down many of his own stylistic hallmarks to adhere to Hollywood conventions more fully. The Max Ophel's inspired tracking shots and one-point perspective compositions are largely absent. The film is certainly shot well, but Kubrick forgoes the specificity of his expression for a more conventional visual style. This is one of the great ironies of Lolita, that the film tells a very non-Hollywood story of child abuse and perversion through the language of Hollywood romance. And crucial to this romantic framing is the way Humbert is positioned as romantic hero. It's his desires which motivate the story, after all. His agency and anguish that takes up the bulk of screen time. Changes to Lolita's plot and structure further emphasize Humbert as a more sympathetic figure than he is in the book. Most essential is the expansion of Claire Quilty. In the book, Quilty's presence is only vaguely alluded to, mentioned offhandedly here and there as the writer of a play Dolores was meant to star in at school. It isn't until the book's final 50 pages, where Dolores reveals it was Quilty who had been following her and Humbert as they fled Beardsley, and Quilty whom she ran off with shortly after. Humbert then tracks a drug-addled Quilty to his mansion and kills him. These plot beats are retained in the film, but given far greater emphasis. Kubrick begins the story in medias res, with the climactic confrontation between Quilty and Humbert reorganizing the plot as a murder mystery. Why did Humbert kill Quilty? The narrative anchor is not Humbert's predatory attraction to Lolita, but his war of wills against Quilty. In his book, Stanley Kubrick and the Art of Adaptation, Greg Jenkins notes that while the novel begins and ends with the word Lolita, the first and last words spoken in the movie are Quilty. Quilty is also far more present in the film, appearing frequently in the first and second act as a nefarious figure hovering dangerously close to Lolita. A mirror image of Humbert, to be sure, but also more openly malicious. After Lolita runs off with Quilty, Quilty even calls Humbert anonymously to mock and torment our protagonist further. These changes place much greater emphasis on Quilty's evil than Humbert's, and according to Jenkins, recast Humbert as the film's de facto hero. This is not to suggest Humbert actually is the hero of Lolita, just that he thinks of himself as such. We may see events of the story outside of Humbert's literal point of view, and indeed are given glimpses of moments and looks that he's not privy to, but the overall tone and structure is still slanted through his subjective filter. Just as Book Humbert uses rhetoric to directly address the reader and try to convince them that he isn't really that bad, so too is Movie Humbert portrayed in a self-flattering light. Even with elements of romantic presentation, however, Kubrick still hints at the core darkness of Humbert's character. Nairmore compares Humbert's anguish when Lolita leaves for Camp Climax to a Douglas Sirk melodrama but it's telling that Kubrick rejects the lush beauty and romanticism of Cirque and Technicolor, and instead shoots in black and white. Jenkins argues that black and white allows Kubrick to quell Humbert's glories, and brings Lolita the grainy aspect of documentary. More pointedly though, black and white visually aligns the film not with the Hollywood heroism of Spartacus, but the bleak fatalism of Kubrick's early noirs. Cumulatively, 
These choices serve as subtle but telling indicators that despite what Humbert may think, this is not a romance, but a dark story of evil and moral corruption. The use of symbols throughout the film also betrays the horror and violence at the heart of Humbert and Lolita's relationship. The opening scene culminates not merely with Quilty's death, but the image of a young girl's portrait torn apart by Humbert's gunfire, a visual invented for the movie which explicitly states Humbert the destroyer of a child. The irony of this visual metaphor is lost on Humbert, who is indeed oblivious to Lolita's pain and only ever prioritizes his own, but nonetheless announces to the audience in no uncertain terms that this is a story of child abuse, and that Humbert is an abuser. So crucial is this image that Kubrick returns to it for the text-based epilogue. Equally crucial is that the first moment of physical contact between Humbert and Lolita occurs at a drive-in showing the curse of Frankenstein. Unlike in the novel, where Humbert is described as resembling a celebrity Dolores likes, the film parallels Humbert to a horror movie monster. The Curse of Frankenstein is a particularly keen choice of film, a Frankenstein adaptation which places great emphasis on Victor being just as monstrous as his creature, despite outwardly appearing like an attractive and sophisticated English gentleman. This directly mirrors Humbert, another supposedly sophisticated Englishman disguising deep-rooted monstrousness through a veneer of intelligence. And for all this talk of monstrosity and abuse, Lolita is also really funny. Though the film strives to replicate Humbert's perspective in its stylistic choices, the nature of the medium also means we have to step outside of Humbert and see him for what he is. The result is a rather warped comedy of manners, wherein a befuddled sad sack awkwardly navigates social cues in his attempts to bed a teenager. This is especially true in the first act under Charlotte's roof, with Humbert's desperation appearing positively buffoonish. Still, Kubrick is precise in how he implements humor, never treating Lolita herself as a subject of mockery. The butt of the joke is always Humbert. This is in fact one of the film's most subversive elements. For all the ways the formal elements are organized around Humbert's self-perception as a romantic hero, actually watching him emphasizes just how pathetic he really is. It should be stressed though that the film's humor still intermingles with the perverse nature of the story. Humbert's dumbstruck face as he watches Lolita here always makes me laugh but it remains deeply disturbing how enthralled he is watching a child play with a children's toy. Much of the comedy in Lolita's first act stems from a discrepancy in knowledge between the audience and the characters, that we know Humbert is lusting after Lolita while the rest of the characters are completely oblivious. This essentially adheres to Alfred Hitchcock's rules for suspense filmmaking, wherein the audience knows there's a bomb under the table, but the characters don't. The result is a nervous laughter, clouded by the sinister intentions we feel coming from Humbert. Consider too how easily Humbert disguises his jealousy under the veil of mere protective parenting. Much of Humbert and Lolita's dynamic in the film's second act is eerily reminiscent of a domineering father controlling his daughter's sexuality by policing her time with boys. Play? I've told you over and over again, I don't want you mixing with those boys. It's just another excuse to make dates with them and to get together close with them. There's an understated humor to this perverse father-daughter affair, but within the laughter is a dark and pointed critique of misogynistic behavior, one that explicitly links abusive behavior to seemingly more benevolent forms of parenting. As Sally Jane Black writes, protectiveness is just another facet of sexual domination, of patriarchy, of the view of women as property. For all the fidelity to the themes of Nabokov's novel, however, much of the details are lost in adaptation. 
The biggest difference is probably the fate of Lolita herself. While the novel's foreword indicates Dolores will die in childbirth, and that her child will be stillborn, her future as a wife and mother is left ambiguous in the film. In more modest yet still meaningful changes, Humbert's backstory has been excised entirely, as have the two years between Lolita's abduction and subsequent letter to Humbert. The book is also very much a travelogue of the United States, something lost entirely with Kubrick's decision to instead shoot in the English countryside. Moving the climax of the story to the beginning also means the film doesn't really have an ending, and just sort of stops after Humbert leaves Lolita with her husband. Pressure from the Hayes office also resulted in Lolita being aged up slightly, and much of her more childish attributes removed, in effect softening the material. One of the most disturbing aspects of the book are the many reminders that Dolores is a child, that Humbert's intense longing is directed towards a kid. These reminders aren't completely absent in the film, Lolita's persistent diet of soda and candy, and general disinterest in adult things serve a similar function, but the emphasis isn't as strong. But the most profound change is in naming. Good night, Leo. In the novel, Lolita is a name only Humbert uses, something he imposes on Dolores Hayes, which further extends his ownership and control over her. But in the movie, everybody calls Dolores Lolita. Lolita. Lolita, that's right. This change was likely made to simplify the story, but it also erases one of Nabokov's most poignant expressions of how Humbert projects his own fantasies onto the fetishized object of his desire, and in doing so, destroys the girl behind his fantasy. Also lost is the irony that the title doesn't really refer to a character in the story so much as an imagined version of her. These shortcomings reflect an inability to fully adapt Lolita to a cinematic form. For all the ways Kubrick may have translated the story and its themes to the big screen, the source material is too intrinsically tied to the novel as an artistic medium, and I think this shows when comparing the book's legacy to the film's. While Kubrick's movies have largely supplanted their source material in the public consciousness, Lolita remains first and foremost a novel. There's a reason the police sing about and not that Stanley Kubrick film. I earlier described Lolita as the anti-Spartacus, but one thing both share is that they amount to relatively minor achievements within their director's greater body of work, whilst being of profound importance to others. To again quote Richard Corliss, For Nabokov, Lolita was a destination, an apotheosis of the themes that occupied him all his life. For Kubrick, it was a signpost to the land he would soon inhabit and conquer. <laughs> Dr. Strange Love. Or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. A moving <laughs> picture. Long before I read Peter George's Red Alert, I'd heard tales of how Stanley Kubrick adapted the atomic thriller into Dr. Strange Love. The story has been enshrined in myth through countless documentaries and retrospectives. In the early 60s, Kubrick was obsessed with atomic weapons and the dangers of the Cold War, reading dozens of novels and non-fiction books about nuclear war, both to satisfy his own curiosity and as research for a potential film. Kubrick eventually chose Red Alert for adaptation, a novel about a rogue US general who launches a nuclear strike against Russia in an attempt to force the president into a full-scale assault. Kubrick was likely drawn to George's extensive understanding of military policy, and the book's perspective that systems designed to protect against nuclear Armageddon paradoxically create the conditions for mutually assured destruction. The original intent was to make a somber thriller in the tone of the source material, 
But during screenwriting, Kubrick realized the material was too outrageous to be taken seriously. Any effort to honestly depict the barrel-chested bravado of nuclear retaliation and the contradictory logic of deterrence theory would seem laughable. Red Alert had to be turned into a comedy, a dark but also farcical satire of Cold War paranoia and the arms race. And doesn't this whole story itself serve as a satirical point? That the very concept of mutually assured destruction is so blatantly absurd only a comedy could adequately convey it. That the war-hungry generals, so eager to justify casualties in the hundreds of millions so long as it meant the enemy were defeated, weren't actually worthy of dramatic treatment, but scathing mockery. But for as insightful a perspective Dr. Strangelove's satire might offer on Cold War politics, reading the actual novel it was based on I discovered something else. This is so boring. The book does have an amazing premise, and the scenario which develops is inherently tense. But George's prose is also rather dry, competently describing the book's action and its technical components, but without much excitement. Aside from the paranoid General Quinton who initiates the bomb run, none of the characters have much personality, and mostly serve either utilitarian functions within the plot, or as mouthpieces to voice the pragmatic and ideological arguments for and against a nuclear attack. I don't doubt that for an enthusiast with an insatiable interest in nuclear catastrophe, Peter George's speculative vision was enough. But I suspect Kubrick also realized a straightforward adaptation would be a bit bland. Comedy not only granted the film a biting satirical edge, it also electrified the plot and characters. Where General Franklin is merely an avatar for massive retaliation, General Buck Turgidson is a gleeful child, positively giddy at the prospect of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. As drama, the President's resigned fatigue and trepidation are not very engaging. But those same characteristics make for wonderful comic tools. Well, I'll tell you what he did. He ordered his planes to attack your country. Uh, well, let me finish, Dimitri. Of particular tedium in Red Alert are the sections aboard the Alabama Angel, one of the B-52s en route to Russia. Though George, himself a former RAF navigator, captures in vivid detail the technical side of the mission, the characters themselves are hopelessly dull. A collection of good boys, hoping to do right by their families and sweethearts back home. Leading this crew is Captain Clint Brown, a skilled if vacant pilot whose personality is summed up as the steady type. And doesn't that vague non-description reveal just how empty this character is? Their mission is carried out with solemn dignity, with the crew unaware of just how cataclysmic their potential success will prove. Dr. Strangelove does not transform this material so much as it skewers its meaning. Sections aboard the B-52 are still awash in technical detail, but this authenticity becomes comical when cut against the sloppy optical effects of the plane flying through the mountains. The crew's mission remains solemn and dangerous, but the milquetoast Captain Brown has been replaced with force of personality Major T.J. Kong. Kong is no more complex than Brown, but his thick southern drawl and cowboy charm are far more entertaining. The dangers the crew face are still genuine, and actor Slim Pickens does not play the material for laughs. But the sheer ridiculousness of Kong's presence completely re-energizes the bomber scenes. That Pickens is himself oblivious to his own absurdity is crucial to the subplot's comedy. To quote Roger Ebert, a man wearing a funny hat is not funny, but a man who doesn't know he's wearing a funny hat, ah, now you've got something. Again though, the laughs come with a bitter satirical pill. Twisting the novel's dedicated and skilled pilot into an archaic cowboy well out of his depth is a rather scathing indictment of US foreign policy at the height of the Cold War. 
the film explicitly linking the specter of nuclear violence to acts of performative masculinity. This is not exclusive to Major Kong, either. Generals Ripper and Turgidson display similar machismo ideals. The film is loaded with phallic imagery, and deep-rooted sexual insecurity drives Ripper's motivation. But the use of Western iconography in particular brings further distinction. That the cowboy is the harbinger of nuclear Armageddon implies that deterrence policies, which theorize peace can be achieved through fear of the other guy's weapon, merely create a modern Wild West, just with much higher stakes. Where Captain Brown is a patient father figure struggling to guide his boys through the darkness, Major Kong is an outdated model of masculinity whose promises of reward only beget death. Rodney Hill likens Kong to a mythic hero embarking on a perilous quest, but there's a deep irony to this journey. It isn't just that the film is in fact lampooning this mythic hero through Pickens, but that the quest itself is not altruistic. The cowboy isn't a rugged individual fighting for justice, but another cog in a system spiraling out of control. These converging themes reach their apex in Kong's final scene, a perfect metaphor of an ignorant and deluded America riding its affinity for big guns into oblivion. But for as much as Kubrick and co-screenwriter Terry Southern have twisted George's writing into a black comedy as maddeningly funny as it is incisively critical, much of Strangelove does stem directly from Red Alert. Plot and structure have seen minimal alteration. A paranoid US Air Force general initiates a nuclear strike against Russia, using an attack plan that can only be recalled with a secret three-letter code. The story is divided into three settings. One of the bombers en route to Russia, the Air Force base fighting off American troops looking to secure the code while the crazed general's subordinate pleads the attack be stopped, and the war room at the Pentagon where the president meets with top military brass to weigh best courses of action. The general commits suicide, but his second-in-command correctly guesses the three-letter code, and all the planes are recalled. All but one, whose damaged radio means it cannot be reached and proceeds to its target, risking inevitable nuclear retaliation. This has all been adapted faithfully. Even the highly sensual and phallic plane refueling scene, something I assumed had to be a Kubrick invention, comes directly from the book. I don't think George was aware of the sexual connotations and was likely just describing the refueling process, but lines about slacking the thirst or how she was fully topped certainly indicate where Kubrick would take the scene. And while the characters have been substantially altered, one remains largely faithful to Peter George's novel. General Quinton has been given the far more loaded name of General Jack D. Ripper, but the underlying character is still recognizable. A hardened but deeply concerned soldier, resolute in his belief that a preemptive nuclear assault on Russia is necessary to ensure American safety. While most of Red Alert's dialogue has been dropped, Many of Ripper's lines come straight from Quentin's mouth. It looks like we're in a shooting war. I would sooner accept a few casualties through accident than lose the entire base and its personnel through carelessness. I happen to believe in a life after this one. I know I'll have to answer what I've done. And I think I can. He said war was too important to be left to the generals. When he said that, 50 years ago, he might have been right. But today, war is too important to be left to politicians. In both works, the character embodies trigger-happy paranoia. Strangelove further stresses parallels to Curtis LeMay, a cigar-chomping general and head of the Strategic Air Command who advocated for use of atomic weapons and unsuccessfully lobbied to bomb Cuban missile sites during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The casting of Sterling Hayden, with his angular masculine features and booming voice, further emphasizes the steadfast conviction of George's writing. Yet for all these similarities, 
Red Alert and Dr. Strangelove ultimately present this character in very different terms. Red Alert may position General Quentin as the villain of the story, but he's also written with a lot of dignity, sympathetic to the lives he's exterminating, but committed to the world peace he feels his actions will achieve. He is also startlingly persuasive in laying out his motivations. Long passages are dedicated to Quentin, rationally explaining the dangers of the Soviet Union and justifying a full-scale preemptive strike as a necessary means to prevent the disaster should Russia attack first. I should note that the premises of Quentin's arguments don't actually hold, specifically his conviction that a nuclear war with the Soviets is inevitable because communists, by their very nature, are ready to strike the first blow. This is nothing more than Red Scare propaganda, but Quentin isn't written as a propaganda-spewing maniac. He's written as a rational agent who's come to an immoral but logical conclusion. Where Major Paul Howard is prone to emotional outbursts, Quentin is calm and unwavering. Indeed, Howard comes to sympathize with and even respect Quentin, horrified by his actions, but understanding of the factors which motivate them. Quentin is Red Alert's villain, but one acting from a place of reason and whom the author depicts with a certain reverence. General Ripper, meanwhile, is a propaganda-spewing maniac, rationalizing his nuclear assault not out of any semi-pragmatic concern of Russia using atomic weapons, but in fear of a secret commie plot to fluoridate America's water sources and pollute the bodily fluids of good Americans. To sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. If that sounds like delusional ramblings with no basis in reality, well, that's because they are. There's nothing to figure out, General Turgidson. This man is obviously a psychotic. But this motive is actually based on a real-life conspiracy theory among the American right-wing that socialists were using the water to turn Americans into zombies. Kubrick leans into the ridiculousness of the theory, using tight close-ups and low angles to indicate Ripper as unstable and deranged, further amplified by Hayden's forceful performance. Opposite Hayden is Peter Sellers as Lionel Mandrake, who serves a similar function narratively as Howard, but whose character has been entirely reworked. Mandrake still stands ideologically opposed to Ripper, but rather than a type of Socratic debate where two compelling viewpoints are weighed against each other, their dynamic is that of a beleaguered and terrified person trying to talk a dangerous idiot out of doing something stupid. Sellers' nervous fettering provides a comic foil to Hayden's unwavering resolve, which only gets funnier as Ripper's pretenses become increasingly nonsensical. The ultimate example of the distinction between Quentin and Ripper is seen in each man's fate. Though both commit suicide, Quentin does so because of his irreparable guilt for the lives he's sacrificed, while Ripper kills himself because, despite his supposed resolve, He's actually a coward who doubts he could withstand torture. Also, his name is Jack the Ripper, so we know he's a bad dude. The big character addition is the titular Strangelove himself, a former Nazi scientist now working as the president's scientific advisor. Strangelove. Can store all the information. What kind of a name is that? I didn't know. Kraut name is it? He changed it when he became a citizen. It used to be McVectic Lieb. Strangelove has no analog in Red Alert, and is part of a more general theme in the film to tie the Cold War more directly to the aftermath of World War II. Bolstered by stray but pointed lines which refer to Mandrake being tortured during the war, and to the Russian campaign against the Nazis. On a literal level, the specter of World War II, and Nazism in particular, implicates the tyranny of nuclear weapons as being born out of fascism. This is no mere speculation. Operation Paperclip was in fact a real program where hundreds of Nazi scientists were given high-profile jobs within the US government, largely related to the Cold War and the space race. Strangelove himself was modeled in part after rocket scientist and Nazi Werner von Braun. 
On a more general level, the repeated references to World War II and its lingering implications suggest a lack of closure. That the defeat of the Nazis did not in fact bring an end to fascism, but a mutation into the atomic age. That fascism is, in Robert Kolker's words, the ghost stirring in the machine of American culture. It's telling that the nuclear apocalypse, which arrives in the film's closing moments, is scored to We'll Meet Again, a wartime ballad ostensibly about the enduring human spirit in dark times. The dark irony of sound and image likely speaks for itself, but the song choice once again stresses the nuclear age as a byproduct of World War II. This scene marks another massive change from the novel, where nuclear disaster is averted after all. Despite radio damage which prevents the last bomber from being recalled, a malfunction prevents the hydrogen bomb from deploying properly, thus avoiding an atomic explosion. No such fortune is granted in Strangelove. Oh sure, there's a malfunction which prevents the bomb from deploying properly, but nothing good old-fashioned American stubbornness can't fix. Kubrick can't accept the novel's optimistic conclusion, where Red Alert ends with hope that humanity's better angels can prevail. The only hope in Strangelove's ending is a bitter joke, we'll meet again. which in fact suggests the opposite. It's a much more cynical conclusion, and a more comedic one too. After 90 minutes of laughs from how dangerously easy all-out nuclear Armageddon would be, the bomb going off is the ultimate punchline. I'm sort of cheating here. 2001 isn't really an adaptation. Following Strangelove, Kubrick enlisted novelist Arthur C. Clarke to make the proverbial good science fiction movie. Together, the two wrote a treatment and eventual screenplay, which formed the basis of Kubrick's film while Clarke developed the story into a novel. 2001 A Space Odyssey would take some influence from previous Clarke stories like The Sentinel, but was functionally an original creation, not beholden to a source text. And yet, I couldn't just skip it in my analysis. For starters, it's 2001. What am I gonna do, not talk about Kubrick's most iconic movie? I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. More importantly though, while not a traditional adaptation, the specific circumstances of 2001's production offer a goldmine for adaptation studies. What we have here is not one artist adapting another's story, but two artists collaborating on a shared concept, then executing it separately in comparable but distinct works. Both Kubrick and Clark were equal partners in the genesis of 2001 A Space Odyssey, but each had to figure out the best ways to adapt the story into their respective medium. The differences in each version of 2001 speak in part to the competing perspectives of Clark and Kubrick, and in part to the different modes of expression which separate literature from film. The basic story of 2001 is largely consistent across both versions. There are differences to be sure, major ones even, but the arc of the story is preserved, as are most of the episodes which comprise it. Though the novel technically breaks its story into six parts, rather than the film's four, both generally adhere to the same four-act structure. The Dawn of Man, the Anomaly on the Moon, the Journey Through Space with the HAL 9000, and finally, the Journey Through the Stargate. Much of this material is condensed in the film. Especially notable is the omission of chapters 31 through 33. Following HAL's deactivation, Clark devotes these chapters to Dave Bowman's solitude aboard Discovery 1 slowly traveling the cosmos, pondering Hal's betrayal, 
and the nature of the unknown alien entity he seeks, while also facing his own loneliness and isolation. The section serves two purposes. First, it gives an explanation for Hal's mistake, which prompted his conflict with Dave and the other astronauts. In a radio broadcast with Mission Control, scientists speculate that keeping a secret from his colleagues caused an error in Hal's programming, which caused him to falsely predict the AE-35 communications module would fail, and his ensuing panic to cover up the error escalated to violence. This isn't confirmed to be what happened, but the explanation does satisfy Bowman. The second purpose is more a matter of pacing, in that the chapters give the reader a break between the emotional intensity of Dave's life-or-death battle with Hal and his mysterious journey through the Stargate. The film does away with all of this, cutting straight from Hal's defeat to the moons of Jupiter. The audience is given no reprieve, and Hal's behavior remains a mystery. One could intuit that an error in programming played a role in his false alarm that the communications module would fail. He does mention concerns about the secrecy of the mission just before detecting module failure, but it's ultimately just speculation. Maybe Hal determined the possibility of human failure jeopardized the success of the mission, and thus the meat sacks needed to die. Or maybe Hal just made an honest mistake, and fearing deactivation, took actions to defend himself. Where Clark gives answers, or at least a possible answer, Kubrick withholds them, forcing the viewer to question things for themselves. This is true more broadly of the two works. Much of what is suggested by the film is stated outright in the novel. Take Prehistoric Man's encounter with the monolith. Clark's prose plainly describes that the character Moonwatcher and the other ape men are possessed by the monolith and forced to perform various tasks involving tools. Kubrick imparts this idea cinematically. The ape men react to the strange new object with both awe and terror. The monolith towers over the group, with the framing emphasizing the opaque slab holding power over these primitive beings. A scene later, Moonwatcher ponders the bones of an animal, when the film suddenly cuts to the godlike image of the monolith against the sun. The diegetic sounds of a distant breeze and chirping of insects is quickly overtaken by Richard Strauss's triumphant music. As we return to Moonwatcher, realizing the bone can be used as a bludgeoning tool. The implication is that this insight is born from the monolith's influence, but the cinematic means by which the idea is planted resonate more emotionally than intellectually. The book is also more forthcoming about the intentions of the alien beings behind the monolith. While the film merely observes the monolith's effect on the ape men, Clark includes a line about how the ape men are being observed. What is observing the ape men and why is not yet clear, but these lines speak overtly to some external power and clear intentionality. There is purpose here. There is an end goal. Much of this intentionality is laid bare in Chapter 37. The alien beings are still shrouded in some mystery, but Clark does reveal that they were, at one point, beings of flesh and blood that they had traveled the cosmos studying life and interfering in the development of various creatures for their experiments, and that they had eventually evolved into beings of pure energy. The nature of the alien motivations is never explained, but they are clearly motivated. All of this is also arguably true of the film version, but it's far more ambiguous. The only depiction of an alien presence is in the monolith itself, accompanied by the haunting music of Hyohei Leggetti. Though seemingly a piece of non-diegetic music used more for atmosphere and tone, one could interpret the leitmotif as representing the aliens themselves, and the ways in which the beings have transcended the physical. Intentionality can also be interpreted in their behaviors. The reason for the initial contact with the ape men may not be explained, but when a second monolith is discovered on the moon, one that had been deliberately buried... Deliberately buried.
it suggests the object is some sort of signpost left for humanity, continuing what had been started eons ago. A similar revelation comes after Dave has conquered Hal, where he and the audience learn of the Jupiter mission's purpose, that the monolith on the moon had sent some sort of signal to Jupiter. The film is very slow to give the audience all these pieces, but putting them together demonstrates that the film's journey was orchestrated by some sort of higher power. It's just never said out loud. It's fundamentally the same story as Clark's novel, but by withholding so much detail and clear guidance, Kubrick forces a higher degree of engagement and interpretation, just to make sense of the story. That discrepancy in detail is also present on a momentary basis, Clark emphasizing process and procedure, where Kubrick emphasizes poetry and emotion. Take Haywood Floyd's spaceship docking the in-orbit space station. This is one of the most iconic scenes in the film, and a sensory delight, a ballet of symmetry and motion set to Johann Strauss's Blue Danube Waltz. The precision and brilliance of man-made machinery rendered literally into a dance. But the novel only spends two pages on this encounter, focusing on the drier details, like how the contrasting rotations of ship and station allow for safe transfer. Gone too is Strauss's beautiful melody, replaced with metallic scratching noises from outside, then the brief hissing of air as pressures equalize. The Floyd section as a whole demonstrates the differing perspectives of Clark and Kubrick. The novel is much more concerned with the details of this sci-fi future, alluding to political crises reflecting the Cold War politics of the 1960s, growing overpopulation, and a food shortage predicting an encroaching famine. Kubrick, meanwhile, emphasizes visual metaphors to suggest how humanity has been rendered helpless by the very technology it's created. Floyd is introduced asleep in his chair, his pen having slipped from his grasp in zero gravity, representing how humanity has lost control of their tools, and foreshadowing Hal's coming mutiny. Floyd is then doted on by a motherly figure, who later provides him with sippy cups. The man even needs to be re-toilet trained. This is not to say that Kubrick is completely unconcerned with authentic details or that Clark is uninterested in metaphor. The film is certainly observant to the how of space travel, whether that be the Velcro shoes, which allow flight attendants to walk in zero gravity, or the centrifugal force, which accounts for the artificial gravity on Discovery 1. Even the zero gravity toilet, a feature exclusive to the film, is a wash in technical detail. It's just that said details are in the background, silently observed, rather than laboriously explained. Clark, meanwhile, is playing with similar metaphors as Kubrick, Floyd noting to himself how the drinking tubes of astronaut food make him feel like a baby. And while the film does not include reference to the political crises on Earth, it doesn't actively refute them either. The secrecy surrounding the discovery on the moon and the suspicion with which Floyd is met by Russian scientists does imply a potential geopolitical conflict, and the references to synthetic foods could be a byproduct of the agricultural scarcity Clark outlines. The novel and film do not contradict each other in these regards, but focus on different aspects of the same story. These differences are, in part, a result of the specific artists. Kubrick's prior film had already dealt extensively in Cold War politics. It makes sense that he'd be weary of foregrounding those same themes again so soon. Indeed, the novel ends with the Star Child detonating and destroying the nuclear weapons orbiting the Earth, something excised from the film supposedly due to its similarities to Doctor Strangelove's ending. With 2001, Kubrick, like the alien entities behind the monolith, is more concerned with cosmic questions of humanity's place within the galaxy, rather than its petty, short-sighted conflicts. Beyond any comparison to Strangelove, Clark ending his novel with the destruction of nuclear weapons is an explicitly political statement, that for humanity to truly ascend, we must move beyond weapons of mass destruction and the primitive, 
tribalistic conflicts which divide us. This is supported elsewhere in the novel, as when Clark states that for as long as man relies on weapons, he was living on borrowed time, and is made yet more explicit in 2010, Clark's sequel novel. Kubrick's ending is far more ambiguous. David's transformation is equal parts glorious and beautiful as it is unknown and existentially terrifying. What does it truly mean to evolve the way David has? Political concern falls away in the face of sheer, awe-inspiring power. Clark's ending also grants the Star Child a moral authority, the sense of an enlightened parent saving humanity from their own barbarism. But the film's ambiguity denies this moral implication. As Nairmore writes, it seems doubtful that Kubrick viewed the development of higher life forms as a necessary advance in morality or peacefulness. The film suggests that every leap forward, every moment of mastery over nature, involves a kind of murder. Stop, will you? Stop. I'm afraid there. It might be tempting to scoff at describing Hal's deactivation a murder given Hal is an artificial intelligence, but if humanity's own intelligence was engineered through the monolith, then why should human life be valued over a computer's? In addition to the narrative and thematic parallels which link David and Moonwatcher, both novel and film also use formal techniques to stress the mirroring of the two. Kubrick famously uses the triumphant music of Richard Strauss's Also Sprague Zarathustra as a leitmotif to signify an evolutionary breakthrough, which will carry humanity to a new form of existence. Clark, meanwhile, uses virtually the same lines to conclude both Moonwatcher's story and the Star Child's. Now he was master of the world, and he was not quite sure what he would do next, but he would think of something. These distinctions and modes of expression define 2001 A Space Odyssey, and how the experience differs on the page versus on the screen. While I've highlighted some of the ways in which Clark and Kubrick differ in their focus and even in plot details, the most profound changes in 2001 are to how ideas are expressed, not the ideas themselves. Let's take the film's famous match cut from Moonwatcher's Bone to a satellite in orbit around the Earth. This is how Kubrick transitions from the prehistoric Dawn of Man sequence to humanity's far advanced future. Eons of evolution and history rendered as an ellipsis. The seamless ease by which one object gives way to another stresses the links between both as tools for humanity and the centrality of these tools in human development. That this led directly to this. But the cut is not a method available to the novelist. Clark could simply end one chapter in the past and begin the next one in the future, which keeps the ellipsis but loses the bridge between concepts. So in order to connect segments, Clark includes a short chapter between Moonwatcher's victory and Haywood Floyd's trip into space detailing the interlinked evolution of humanity and advancement of their tools, culminating by noting the rapid advancement in weaponry, and how that bestowed mankind with power as the dominant species on Earth. Novel and film also diverge when Dave makes it to the other side of the Stargate, and into the room. The book's setting is more modern than the movie's neoclassical architecture, but the more substantial shift is how Bowman is transformed into the Star Child. Clark tries to make the strangeness relatable through both the details of the room and how Bowman interacts with it. First, Clark describes aspects of the room, a telephone, the desk drawers which cannot open, the odd selection of books and magazines. As Bowman moves through the space, the reader is given insight into his mind as he ponders the likelihood that he is being tested and observed. Bowman comes to the refrigerator and consumes the strange food and liquid found within, 
has a shower, watches the television, which reveals the room itself is a replica based on TV transmissions from Earth, and finally falls asleep. Another two chapters follow, dedicated to the psychological and physiological transformation from man into Star Child. Despite the fantastical scenario, Clark grounds the experience in tangible details, as Dave tries to make rational sense of what is going on. There is a literal story, with the food and drink Bowman ingests even suggesting a possible cause for his transformation into the Star Child in the two subsequent chapters. Kubrick abandons this literalism for cinematic abstraction. No explanation is offered for what this room is. The focus is instead on Dave's transformation. As the Discovery Pod sits idle in the room, Dave looks out the window. An eyeline match reveals the object of Dave's gaze, Dave Bowman himself, outside his pod. Tighter close-ups emphasize both Dave's confusion and his advanced age, while the reverse angle reveals that both the pod and the younger Dave are gone. This same pattern in cutting and perspective is used twice more, as Dave discovers older versions of himself who look back only to reveal the younger version has disappeared. Eyeline matches and shot reverse shot editing patterns are basic techniques in continuity filmmaking, but they are used here to convey Dave's rapid aging, setting the stage for a final encounter with the monolith and rebirth as the Star Child. Kubrick reaches the same end goal as Clark, but does so through uniquely cinematic modes of expression. The scene may not literally depict Bowman transforming into an old man and celestial being, but the idea is conveyed through the progression of images. This emphasis on editing and perspective allows Kubrick to find spots for drama unavailable to Clark. My favorite example of this is Hal reading Dave and Frank's lips as they discuss deactivating Hal. This scene is completely unique to the film, with no analog in the novel, and uses specifically cinematic methods of storytelling. The very concept is innately cinematic. Hal sees something he wasn't intended to. Notice too the whip pans between sets of lips, simulating the impression of panicked glances back and forth. The scene creates a Hitchcockian suspense absent in the novel. That suspense becomes even more pronounced given this is where the intermission hits. When the Discovery returns on screen, accompanied by heavy breathing through a space helmet, we meet it with a deep sense of unease and dread. Kubrick uses both the visual language of movies and the structure of the Roadshow epic to create effects that are unique to the film version. This notion of concepts being innately cinematic is something that shrouds much of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Unlike all the other stories discussed in this video, 2001 was conceived as a film, first and foremost. Even though it was conceived in collaboration with an accomplished sci-fi novelist, the end goal was always a movie, and the movie is indeed 2001 in its purest form. That's not to say the novel is bad, far from it, it's an enthralling read and a great companion to the film, but there is an elegant simplicity to the way concepts and ideas are expressed on screen that is lost on the page. I have to assume Clark agreed, given his sequel novel 2010 retcons several plot details to be more in line with the film rather than the book, implicitly acknowledging the film as the primary text. In its very foundations, 2001 A Space Odyssey was designed for the cinema, but this would not be the case with Kubrick's next adaptation. Most of Kubrick's source texts tended to be either pulpy genre stories or fairly obscure novels written decades before their filmed adaptations. Only twice did Kubrick tackle contemporary, highbrow literature, Lolita and A Clockwork Orange, and curiously, the two share many parallels. Both are profoundly violent stories told with a darkly humorous slant, 
Both revolve around monstrous protagonists who bury their evil with a veneer of sophisticated intelligence. Hell, both films overtly reference Kubrick's preceding roadshow epic. Are you Quilty? No, I'm Spartacus. But most importantly, both books presented Kubrick with the same challenge. How do you adapt a first-person narrative to a cinematic form? Anthony Burgess's novel is written entirely from the perspective of its young hero, Alex, with both his brutal crimes and brutal treatment at the hands of the state rendered through the protagonist's voice. Kubrick retains Alex's role as narrator, and though his thoughts are not as omnipresent as they are in the book, the overall perspective is kept. Many lines of voiceover are repeated from the page almost verbatim. There was me, that is Alex, and my three droogs, that is Pete, Georgie, and Dim. And we sat in the Corova milk bar, trying to make up our Razoo dogs what to do with the evening. Then the disc on the stereo twanged off and out. And in the short silence before the next one came on, she suddenly came with a burst of singing. This is the real weepy and like tragic part of the story beginning, oh my brothers and only friends. He was sentenced to 14 years in Stager number 84F. I jumped, oh my brothers, and I fell hard, but I did not snuff it. If I had snuffed it, I would not be here to tell what I told have. You'll notice too the colorful language, a slang dialect called NADSAT, created by Burgess. Kubrick maintains this slang in both the book's dialogue and Alex's voiceover, but it's worth stressing that the entirety of the book is relayed through this vernacular. This not only extends Alex's subjectivity, but it further skewers the world. The reader not only needing to parse truth from Alex's perspective, but also decipher the language. Visual presentation of the world means the film loses this puzzle-solving quality, but Kubrick still skewers the world depicted through his filmmaking style. The camera largely takes Alex's point of view, often literally, using wide-angle lenses to elongate the features of others, while winding tracking shots distort physical space into a carnival funhouse. In Roger Ebert's words, we see the world as Alex does, as a crazy house of weird people out to get him. The film is also structured to correspond to Alex's emotional state. The first act, which sees Alex at his most amoral and in the midst of his crime spree, is exhilarating. Kubrick hurtles through scene after scene with ferocious energy, emphasizing speed, movement, and the gregarious charm of Alex's personality. The best example of this is the gang fight, a chaotic montage of free-flowing violence. There is almost no continuity between shots, and the spatial geography is wildly inconsistent. The focus is instead on momentary impacts, snippets of a brawl loosely strung together in a frenzy of quickly cut images. The audience doesn't experience the battle as it happens, but as a sensual rush of power and excitement, the very same rush Alex feels. When Alex goes to prison in Act 2, both his life and the movie come to a crashing halt. Shots are static and held a lot longer, with cutting patterns adhering to the basic ebb and flow of continuity editing rather than pure sensation. Camera movement is more seldom, and when the camera does move, it's measured and deliberate. Sensory pleasure is replaced by an adherence to routine. the film replicating the same mundanity Alex is enduring. Act 3 sees Alex thrown back into the world after being made helpless by the Ludovico treatment, where he is besieged by all those he wronged in the film's first act. Snap zooms emphasize Alex's terror, low angles his weakness against his enemies, who delight in his suffering. Uh, well, well, well. <laughs> the rapid cutting that had prior noted the rush of violence now conveys horror, with Alex's victim instead of perpetrator. Even moments which Alex isn't technically privy to are still filtered through his character. 
when the writer discovers that the young man he has assisted is the very same delinquent that assaulted his wife, the low angle and exaggerated physicality emphasizes an uncanny horror, even though he's technically the victim. In orienting A Clockwork Orange's style and tone around the personality of its immoral hero, Kubrick, as he had on Lolita, risks accusations that his film is celebrating the protagonist's violence and cruelty. Nairmore writes, For many viewers, the film seems to express a kind of radical libertarianism, based on a deep-seated contempt for human civilization. It loads the deck against every adult, implies the official society is as violent and ruthless as the criminals it aims to suppress, and appears to endorse the free expression of Alex's sadism over any kind of religious and secular law and order. Among such viewers were prominent film critics like Roger Ebert and Pauline Kael, who were morally and ideologically repulsed with what they felt was a celebration and vindication of Alex. And to their credit, I do see where they're coming from. Depiction may not equal endorsement, but Kubrick's cutting is so gleeful in jumping from one violent act to another, his camera so vibrant in capturing an off-kilter society, and McDowell's performance so charismatic and charming that it's almost impossible not to be swept up in the force of Alex's personality. The film also cuts some of the more unsavory aspects of Alex from the book, and makes the character easier to identify with. Most notable is an episode where Alex attacks two preteen girls, replaced by a consensual threesome with two adults, a scene which plays as farcical given the phallic imagery and rendition of the William Tell overture. <laughs> Turning one of the book's darkest acts of violence into a comical aside softens Alex, at least a little bit. That all said, I disagree with the assertion that Kubrick's film is a glorification of its sadistic hero. For all the ways the style serves to replicate Alex's point of view, there are key moments where the film steps outside his perspective. Take the infamous assault in the writer's home. Though the camera initially comes throttling in with Alex and his droogs, the scene construction suddenly shifts when Alex whistles his men at attention. Now, Kubrick uses a long shot, which offers a more distanced and objective point of view, observing the violence from afar. The frantic cutting and shaky camera of the gang fight a scene prior gives way to a modest pan and a multi-camera setup to clearly direct attention towards the violence. This distancing serves to temporarily place the viewer outside of Alex's perspective. The low placement of the camera then places the viewer alongside the writer, subjugated by this vicious gang and completely powerless. The only close-ups are shots of the writer and his wife in pain, emphasizing their horror and suffering. Alex himself is shown through the writer's literal point of view, the wide-angle lens and grotesque mask signifying the character's monstrosity. For all the ways in which the film is stylized to recreate Alex's personality cinematically, Kubrick draws a line here, stepping outside Alex's perspective and instead fostering identification with his victims. But even when the film's style and tone does align with Alex's point of view, it often does so with an ironic quality. Kale notes that Kubrick pours on the hearts and flowers, as Alex is repeatedly trampled on in the film's third act, something most evident when Alex is rejected by his parents. The saccharine score and heavy sobs of Alex's mother may imply tragedy, but the music is so heavy-handed. The cries of actor Sheila Rayner, so over the top. <laughs> now look what you're gonna do to your mother. <laughs> that the scene plays as parody. The film's identification with Alex's pain is not sincere, it's hilarious. Far from celebrating Alex, the scene makes a mockery of the lad. Burgess plays a similar trick when he has Alex refer to his stint in prison as the weepy and tragic part of the story. Both moments derive humor from the dissonance in how Alex sees his life 
versus how the audience does. But the fact that film necessitates leaving an entirely first-person perspective allows Kubrick to laugh at Alex, instead of just with. A similar dissonance is at play in how the audience is cued to the ways in which Alex is used and abused by the government, but Alex remains naive. Alex clearly leans into the hardships he suffered from the Ludovico treatment as leverage against the Minister of the Interior, but is less perceptive of the government's subtler exploitation. As the Minister explains how the writer has been put away, it's clear to the audience that the state has used this incident as a means to silence one of its political enemies, and can now use Alex as a mascot to curry favor with the public. But Alex either doesn't notice or doesn't care, content instead to be waited on hand and foot, willing to cooperate with the government despite the abuses they've committed against him. Consider, too, when Alex describes his dream of doctors performing surgery on his brain. I kept having this dream. And like all these doctors were playing around with me Gulliver. You know, like the inside of my brain. The doctor's expression signals to the audience that this was no dream. They really were experimenting on Alex's brain. But Alex never actually puts this together because he's a rube. Ah. The point of all this is not to suggest a simple binary of Alex's helpless victim against an evil government, but to highlight Alex's acquiescence to an oppressive state, and the hypocrisy of a government whose desire to rehabilitate crime has no real incentive beyond their own self-preservation. Critique of the state is at the core of A Clockwork Orange, both the novel and the film, particularly regarding the treatment of prisoners. That the Ludovico treatment is both barbarous and ineffective is unambiguous. Burgess's prose details the torturous pain, as does Malcolm McDowell's screams of agony. Stop it! Stop it! Please! I beg you! Both works also overtly raise the point that the rehabilitation is a lie. Alex refrains from violence not from a sincere change in character, but from fear of the pain and illness violent urges provoke in him. Though a fictional concept, this idea reflects a very real criticism of criminal justice systems whose primary means of curbing crime is fear of punishment. You felt ill this afternoon because you're getting better. When we're healthy, we respond to the presence of the hateful with fear and nausea. That Alex be a particularly brutal criminal, one whose violence is motivated purely by the pleasure it brings him, is essential to Clockwork's critique. If you compare A Clockwork Orange to other films which criticize prisons and the criminal justice system, you'll notice most do so largely by garnering sympathy for their incarcerated protagonist. I Want to Live highly fictionalizes the true story of Barbara Graham, suggesting the executed prisoner was in fact innocent of her accused crime of murder. The movie's indictment of capital punishment is intrinsically tied to the presumed innocence of its hero. Birdman of Alcatraz stacks the deck in favor of imprisoned murderer Robert Strode, repeatedly demonstrating not just his intelligence, but how kind-hearted and gentle he is too. The tragedy of the film is not the inherent brutality of the prison system or the inhumane ways prisoners are treated, but that such hardship could befall a nice guy like Robert. Both films go easy on the audience, in a way that A Clockwork Orange doesn't. Said Kubrick himself in an interview with Gene Siskel, If Alex were a lesser villain, then you would dilute the point of the film. It would be like one of those westerns, where they purport to be doing a film which is against lynching, and so they lynch innocent people. The point of the film seems to be, you shouldn't lynch people because you might lynch innocent people, rather than, you shouldn't lynch anybody. Alex is most certainly not innocent, and while McDowell may bring a Devil May Care charm which makes the character strangely likable, he is in no way a kind-hearted or gentle person. Critique of the criminal justice system or the treatment of prisoners is not tied to the innate goodness of the film's hero. To object to the tortures of the Ludovico treatment is not because Alex is a good boy who deserved better, but because the abuse is inherently unethical, regardless of who it is committed against. 
That Alex is not just guilty, but positively gleeful in his crimes makes for a challenging viewing experience, wherein the viewer's own convictions regarding the injustice of the prison industrial complex are contrasted by the extreme brutality of the prisoner. This contrast is not, as it has often been accused of, a means to signal Alex a lone hero against a more twisted world. Rather, the two extremes force viewers to seriously examine their own principles and beliefs. The sense of challenging one's own convictions is integral to the novel, where the writer character is a direct stand-in for Burgess himself. The book this character is writing is titled A Clockwork Orange, whose themes of how the laws and conditions of mechanical creation are imposed on man are identical to the real novel's themes of how discipline renders human beings into machines. Additionally, Burgess has claimed that the attack on this character and his wife was based on the real-life attack on Burgess's own wife during the Blitz. Just as the fictional writer is forced to reconcile his criticisms of the state with the interpersonal violence committed against his loved ones, Burgess forces himself to do the same. Kubrick is loyal to this lack of compromise even when changing the details. The most significant deviation made from the novel is the ending. While the film concludes with Alex being cured of the Ludovico treatment and once again free to indulge his sadistic violence, the novel includes an additional chapter, where Alex, having formed a new gang of droogs, feels bored and adrift. After reuniting with a former member of his old gang, now happily married, Alex decides of his own accord that he has outgrown his need for ultra-violence, and vows to live the life of a loving family man. This chapter was omitted from the US release of the novel that Kubrick first read. When he finally did read this chapter, he found it unconvincing and inconsistent with the style and intent of the book. I agree with this assessment. Alex's transformation in the final chapter feels insufficiently motivated and the way Burgess equates Alex's vicious violence as a youthful dalliance to be simply outgrown is not fully fleshed out. More simply, the film's ending maintains the challenge for the audience. Where the novel provides comfort that Alex will rehabilitate on his own, the movie stews in uncertainty. Rectifying the abuses committed against Alex also means introducing the possibility that Alex will return to horrific violence. Namor notes that Alex ends the film in approximately the same condition as he was in the beginning. Then again, maybe he doesn't. It certainly seems significant that Alex's triumphant final fantasy is of consensual sex, not the violence or abuse he had fantasized of earlier when still in prison. Another key change from the book is Alex's response to the slides. In the novel, his answers revel in violence and pain, but McDowell's improvised responses in the film are more mischievous than criminal. Compare Alex's response to a picture of a naked woman in the book. These were like pictures of real horror show devotchkas, and I said I would like to give them the old in-out, in-out with lots of ultraviolence. To Alex's response in the movie, uh, no time for the old in and out love. I've just come to read the meter. Good. Kubrick teases at a possible rehabilitation, but he doesn't offer any easy answers. For the third time in his career, Kubrick found himself adapting a novel written entirely in the first person. Apart from a very brief epilogue, The Luck of Barry Lyndon is told entirely from the perspective of its titular rogue hero, as Barry recounts how he conned his way from a penniless family in Ireland and into the aristocracy of 18th century England, before eventually losing his wealth and being cast out to die in obscurity. Kubrick's film is largely faithful to Thackeray's rise and fall narrative, at least in broad strokes. Barry sets off on adventure after winning a duel against an English officer, serves in two different armies during the Seven Years' War, marries into wealth, and is eventually undone by his hateful stepson, Lord Bullingdon. Individual details have been changed, lots in fact. 
The film cuts Barry's efforts to court the Princess Olivia before his marriage to Lady Lyndon, Lord Bullington's military service in America has been omitted, and the film adds a climactic duel between Barry and Bullington to precipitate Barry's exile, to list just a few changes. But Kubrick's most substantial deviation from the novel is not in plot, but in dropping the first-person perspective employed by Thackeray. Where the book is presented akin to a memoir written by Barry as he languishes in prison, the film opts for an omniscient third party to narrate the action. Barry had his faults, but no man could say of him that he was not a good and tender father. A simple change which fundamentally transforms the story. Thackeray's novel is defined by its unreliable narrator, with the reader having to parse the narrative from Barry's self-flattering recollections. Kubrick could have achieved a similar effect by aligning the film's formal elements to favor the perspective of his protagonist, as he had on Lolita and A Clockwork Orange, but Barry Lyndon takes the opposite approach. The camera often employs an objective point of view, with vast, wide frames which place the viewer at some distance from an image's subject. There are exceptions to this style. Battles and fight scenes notably place the camera within the heart of the action, but dialogue scenes and moments of intimacy are filmed with a more restrained and detached tone. Coupled with the omniscient narrator, the film leaves little room for subjectivity within the plot. The events are not themselves in doubt, but Barry is. Without Thackeray's internal monologue to map out Barry's every step and the motivations behind them, the audience is left in the dark as to what the character is thinking. Ryan O'Neill's performance offers some insights, but it too is marked largely by an unyielding stoicism. In effect, Barry becomes something of a mystery who invites intrigue. Why does he risk his own life to save Captain Potsdorf, the source of Barry's oppression and the one responsible for his conscription in the Prussian army? Was this an intentional move to curry favor and turn an enemy into an ally? A goal accomplished if it was so or a less cynical act of kindness, or sheer instinct in the heat of a frenzied battle. Why does Barry, after all the violence committed between him and his stepson, spare the lad in their duel? Is this a mercy from Barry? An admission of his own sins? Or perhaps another calculated effort to curry the favor of an enemy? If the latter, the effort is less successful than with Potsdorf. The film's narrator will occasionally speak to Barry's more clear-cut emotions, his despair over Captain Grogan's death, his envy for Nora's affections, but Kubrick leaves Barry's more curious and contradictory choices fully ambiguous. Thackeray does not leave space for this kind of ambiguity. At every turn, Barry explains himself to be a schemer, working to benefit himself. This difference in characterization is best emphasized by the scene where Barry first meets and wins the favor of the Chevalier de Balabari, an Irish exile living in Berlin. The context of this meeting is the same for both Kubrick and Thackeray. Barry has been sent to infiltrate the services of Balabari and spy on his gambling for the Prussians. And in both cases, Barry confesses himself to be a fellow Irishman sent on false pretenses, bursting into tears over finally having a link to home. But the novel adds a crucial distinction. Balabari is not just Irish, he's also Barry's uncle, a fact Barry is sure to confirm before revealing himself. While Barry's outpouring of emotion may well be genuine, it is also a measured gamble to improve his own station. Film Barry does not have the assurance of family, nor is he working an angle. His tears are more simply a desperate cry for home. <laughs> this difference runs through the heart of both works. While both broadly cover the same events, the novel presents Barry as a much more self-serving character. Every step taken is a calculated move on his quest up the aristocracy. Film Barry also seeks class ascendance and wealth, but in stepping outside his perspective, 
Kubrick emphasizes just how helpless and vulnerable the character is. The opaqueness of O'Neill's performance is itself revealing. He doesn't really know what he's doing, and is in effect just making it up as he goes along. Which is not to suggest Thackeray's Barry is any more cunning or effective than his cinematic counterpart. Make no mistake, book Barry is every bit the dope that film Barry is. It's just that the novel's first-person perspective allows Barry to mask his ineptitude behind the veil of his own machinations. But each meets the same fate. But fate had determined that he should leave none of his race behind him, and that he should finish his life poor, lonely, and childless. In both works, for example, Barry is robbed of all his money shortly after fleeing his hometown his poverty eventually motivating his enlistment in the British Army. In the film, this is a simple stick-up, with the politeness of the thieving Captain Feeney and Kubrick's use of static medium shots emphasizing the comedy of Barry immediately falling into misfortune the second he sets off on adventure. In the novel, this act is more elaborate, with Barry seduced by a pair of con artists who slowly bleed Barry dry all while Barry thinks he's the one dazzling them with tall tales of his pedigree. Both scenes are revealing of the character's buffoonery, but Kubrick is more transparent, his Barry yet more helpless and adrift. You can put down your hands now, Mr. Barry. Thackeray's Barry, on the other hand, always thinks of himself as the con man, even when he's really the mark. Self-deception is indeed at the heart of the story. As Jeffrey O'Brien argues, Barry's greatest naivete is to persuade himself that he can breach social barriers and become an English aristocrat. This is true of Barry in both the novel and the film, though each expresses the concept in different ways. For Thackeray, self-deception is most evident in Barry's grandiose boasting. The novel is defined by verbose monologues, wherein Barry outlines his worth, sophistication, and the immense respect his name and reputation are held in. From the very first page, Barry compares his own rise and fall to that of Adam and Eve, sure to blame the fall on a woman rather than his own hubris, and declares there is not a single gentleman in Europe unfamiliar with the house of Barry. And that's about the level of modesty you can expect from Barry's inner monologue. The irony is, of course, that the opposite is true. No matter how elegantly Barry can pontificate on his own virtues, the outcomes of his adventures allude to a more plausible truth, that Barry is a bitter scoundrel, viewed with utter contempt by the aristocracy he so violently attempts to worm his way into. Try though we might, Barry cannot hide the disdain with which the Princess Olivia or Lady Linden view him or his eventual defeat at the hands of Lord Bullingdon and exile back into poverty, granted only a small annuity to live off of. Film Barry lacks the novel's loquaciousness or unending arrogance, but his actions demonstrate similar delusions regarding his class mobility. The second half of the movie concerns Barry's efforts to achieve a lordship by following the customs of the aristocracy. Unlike his card cheating with Balabari, and unlike in the book, where Barry bullies Lady Linden into marriage, the movie has Barry pursue a lordship through legitimate means. If he can marry an heiress, ingratiate himself in the right social circles, and purchase enough fine art, then surely Barry can transcend his humble origins, and reinvent himself as a gentleman. But these efforts prove futile. No matter how thoroughly Barry follows the rules, or plays the role of lord, lordship is never actually granted. He is only ever seen as a poser, dabbling in a world he doesn't belong to. Is that the way to behave to your father? My father was Sir Charles Linden. We were very fond of Sir Charles Linden. The insolent Irish upstart whom you have taken into your bed. It is not only the lowness of his birth and the general brutality of his manners which disgusts me, but the shameful nature of his conduct towards your ladyship his brutal and ungentlemanlike behavior. The final straw is Barry's very public assault on Lord Bullingdon, a violent outburst wherein the orderly procedure and mise-en-scene is broken, not just by Barry's attack, 
but the sudden shift to a chaotic, handheld camera and tight close-ups. This is a rupture to decorum the aristocracy cannot tolerate, sowing the seed for Barry's inevitable defeat and rejection. The irony here is that the ruling class's power is in fact maintained through violence, something both Kubrick and Thackeray show us in detail. Whether in the macro sense of warring nations, or in micro, as in the corporal punishment used discipline. But such acts are meant to be carried out behind closed doors, or on a battlefield somewhere else. For Barry to openly display such savagery indicates he is little more than a brute in fancy clothes. The class roles of 18th century Europe ultimately prove too rigid a notion the film reinforces by tweaking the ending. Rather than Barry being sent to the Fleet Prison in London, as in the novel, the movie has Barry exiled from England and retreating home to Ireland, stressing the circular nature of Barry's journey. As with the killing 20 years earlier, Kubrick has made a film about a man whose efforts only bring him right back to where he started, with nothing accomplished in the long run. And like the killing, the same yearning for total control underlines Barry Lyndon. I suspect it was this theme of control that drew Kubrick to Thackeray's rather obscure novel in the first place. The story is defined by Barry's failure to overcome his own powerlessness and gain some matter of influence, his desperation to win the affections of his cousin, escape the military death march, and finally ascend the aristocracy, all ending in crushing failure as if it were destiny. Kubrick expands on Barry's lack of agency by stripping him of the one thing he could control in the novel, the narrative. For whatever Barry's failures, Thackeray's first-person perspective at least allowed Barry the authority in telling his own story. It isn't until the conclusion that Barry's grip on the narrative breaks, as the perspective abruptly shifts mid-chapter to an unnamed third party who summarizes Barry's death and the final years of his life. But in foregoing the novel's first-person perspective entirely, Kubrick denies Barry any control. From its very opening, where we see Barry's father killed while Barry is still a child, the film is emphasizing Barry's powerlessness in the face of a world which utterly dwarfs him. Duels are in fact of central importance to the film, and were largely conceived by Kubrick. Only the battle with Captain Quinn, which springboards Barry's adventure, comes from the novel. The introduction and climax were invented for the movie. These duels are how the film measures Barry's sense of agency. In the first duel, Barry is still a child and has no control in the death of his father, a loss which defines Barry's loneliness and haunts over his cycle of new father figures. In the second duel, Barry thinks he's in control. He's the one who laid down the challenge, and he also bests Quinn. It isn't until later that Barry learns that the whole thing was a setup. The plan of the duel was all arranged in order to get you out of the way. Barry's pistol was loaded with a non-lethal ammunition. Despite all his efforts, Quinn and Nora have married anyway, and Barry has thrown his life into chaos for nothing. In the final duel, Bullingdon accidentally fires his pistol into the ground, offering an easy killing shot for Barry. Finally, after a lifetime of struggling with the chaos of the world, of his life being upended in duels he never had the power to influence, Barry has control. But instead of taking that control, he throws it away. I speculated earlier about why Barry spares Bullington, and one possible answer comes from Thackeray. Near the end of the novel, as Barry is forced out of England, the character admits he simply lacks the strength to keep fighting. Sparing Bullington may similarly be less a mercy than it is an expression of exhaustion. A lifetime of fighting against destiny has left Barry hollow and alone. Rather than continue fighting, Barry gives himself over to fate. Kubrick's visual style reinforces the notion of individual powerlessness in a vast and overwhelming world. 
where most film epics use their sprawling runtimes and lavish production value to reinforce their hero's grandeur and importance, Barry Lyndon persistently stresses the smallness of its subject. Long shots create a visual objectivity, which decenters Barry as a singular point of importance, and the character is frequently depicted as ridiculous by the camera. The subjectivity is primarily broken in fight scenes or battles, where the cinematography and editing become frenzied and chaotic. Sometimes Barry finds triumph in that chaos, but it's always short-lived. A recurring technique is for the camera to begin close to Barry before slowly zooming out to an extreme long shot, where the man is lost amidst the enormity of the rest of the frame, visualizing Barry's smallness within the world. But despite his reputation as a nihilistic figure, Kubrick is in fact far more empathetic to his titular character than Thackeray is. For whatever the character's cruelties and callousness, the film also adds acts of kindness, big and small. While the vulnerability which comes from stepping outside Barry's self-aggrandizing generates sympathy. Barry may be an atypical hero for a film epic, he may even be a real bastard at points, but he is not fully a bad person. But Thackeray's Barry is a monster. It isn't just that the character is unrelentingly pompous, he's also a violent bully who only ever cares about himself. Compare how the two works depict the death of Barry's young son, Brian. In the movie, this sequence is a reservoir of pain and grief, a loss that fundamentally breaks Barry's spirit, and one of the few times the film's soundtrack runs in parallel to the emotions of the protagonist. In the novel, while Barry expresses some sadness for the loss of his son, his first words upon the boy's death are a lament for his social standing. There he lay, the hope of my family, the pride of my manhood, the link which kept me and my Lady Linden together. Brian dies, and Barry takes that personally. Even when ostensibly mourning his son, Barry can't help but shift focus to his own brilliance. In effect, the luck of Barry Linden is a story of comeuppance. A schemer, liar, con man and abuser wreaks havoc across the English aristocracy and eventually gets what he deserves. But in Kubrick's hand, Barry Lyndon is a tragedy, of a flawed but sympathetic man chewed up and spit out by the upper class. There is no moral comeuppance. Indeed, it is Barry's most virtuous deed that proves his undoing. But the tragedy isn't just Barry's. The final scene of the movie is not of the titular character, but Lady Lyndon, whose relationship to Barry has been changed dramatically from the book. In the novel, Barry unambiguously bullies Lady Lyndon into marriage and submission, and frequently notes his hatred for the woman. The film presents their courtship and marriage in more uncertain terms. The narrator establishes that Barry's immediate goals are financial security, but his first seduction is a lush and deeply romantic scene, where the allure between characters is far more sensuous than it is economic. True, once the pair wed, Barry becomes mean-spirited and flaunts affairs, but this section of the film is rather short-lived. After seeing the pain his adultery has caused Lady Linden, Barry apologizes in a guilt-tinged scene whose blocking and camera movement call back to their first romance. And from this point, we see no signs of Barry's cruelty to Lady Linden, nor any affairs. Even when Brian dies and each character is wrecked with sorrow, they never turn against each other. The decision to exile Barry is not actually made by Lady Linden, it's made by Bullingdon and his inner circle. And so, we come to the final scene, and Lady Linden signing checks, where Barry's name prompts a notable emotional reaction. The exact nature of those feelings is not clear, though the return of the same Franz Schubert piece which scored their seduction suggests some inklings of love remain. But Bullingdon presses on, and those feelings go unspoken and unacted on. In its last moments, the film suggests 
that it is not only Barry who lives powerlessly within this system. The film finally concludes with a title card, which reads, It was in the reign of George III that the aforesaid personages lived and quarreled. Good or bad, handsome or ugly, rich or poor, they are all equal now. These lines are in fact taken almost verbatim from the novel, said by Barry himself in fact, as he summarizes his family history to help establish the book's setting and power structure. But in repurposing those lines for an epilogue, the title card acts as a summarizing statement of Barry Lyndon's themes. The lack of agency individuals possess over their lives and legacy, and the overwhelming power of monarchy. King George and old England forever! <laughs> haven't done much in this video is talk about what the various authors Kubrick adapted thought of the movies made from their work. That's mostly because there isn't really much tea to spill. Some source authors were dead long before Kubrick took on their books, so they understandably didn't have much to say, and while Nabokov and Burgess expressed some hints of disappointment in the adaptations of Lolita and A Clockwork Orange, such expressions were minor. This is not the case with Stephen King, who famously hates Kubrick's 1980 horror adaptation and has not been shy to tell anyone who will listen. You can find countless interviews where King laments the changes Kubrick made to the characters and the perceived coldness of his filmmaking style. At this point, I could recite King's core critique of the movie in my sleep, that Kubrick's The Shining is like a beautiful Cadillac with no engine inside an immaculately made movie with pristine craftsmanship and technique, all to support a film without emotional stakes or sufficient character arcs. King is quite fond of this metaphor. During the development of this video while visiting my parents, I could literally hear my dad in the next room watching Eli Roth's History of Horror TV series, and King once again explaining how he hates Kubrick's film because it's like an engineless Cadillac. In the pantheon of Stephen King adaptations, it might seem baffling that this would be the one the writer would hold such ire for. Surely, worse movies have been made from King's work than this. Why does Kubrick's adaptation still get under King's skin so insidiously? Some Kubrick fans have speculated that King is jealous of Kubrick's The Shining because he recognizes it to be superior to his own. I don't really buy this, in part because King has in fact been incredibly gracious regarding other high-quality adaptations of his work, but it is worth noting that a lot of the most iconic, shining elements were cinematic inventions. The Elevator of Blood, The Hedge Maze, Come Play With Us Danny, Writing Red Rum and Lipstick on the Door, Here's Johnny, All Work and No Play Makes Jack a Dull Boy, none of these appear in King's book. Filippo Ulivari has speculated that part of King's derision might have stemmed from a greater distaste for highbrow intelligentsia. King has frequently criticized what he believes to be a snobbish dismissal of horror fiction from the academic world. Kubrick, meanwhile, opted not to work with King on the screenplay and instead partnered with novelist and university professor Diane Johnson, very much the embodiment of the avatars of high culture King so detested. Indeed, King criticized Kubrick and Johnson's research into the psychological underpinnings of horror stories, and King's culminating thesis that Kubrick is a man who thinks too much and feels too little is tinged with anti-intellectualism. Ultimately though, Ulivari suggests that King's hate comes from a simpler and more personal place. Writing The Shining was a therapeutic process for Stephen King. In a 1982 essay, King revealed that Jack Torrance was an embodiment of the author's own experiences and anxieties as a fledgling writer. Jack's fear of being a personal and professional failure, his dependency on alcohol, even his capacity for harming his family, all came from King's own fears about himself. 
This is in fact the source for much of the novel's horror. The second chapter establishes Jack's rage, and history of violent abuse through Wendy's perspective. Actions and feelings which will haunt Jack throughout the narrative. Jack's internal monologue is overwhelmed by guilt and shame, which manifests as an intense self-loathing, all bound by a history of alcohol abuse. The ghosts of the Overlook carry a similar terror as the alcoholism, an external force which threatens to consume Jack, destroying his kindness and leaving only a husk of blind, dangerous hatred. Much of the book's tension stems from seeing Jack struggle with his angry thoughts, coaxed by the Overlook into embracing oblivion, best symbolized in Lloyd the Bartender offering Jack a drink. After spending several hundred pages reading Jack's struggles with addiction and to be a better man, it isn't just scary when he gives in. It's tragic. But even after losing himself to the evils of the Overlook, there is also redemption. The real Jack Torrance able to break through for one final, touching moment with his son, before Jack is destroyed, along with the Overlook, while his family goes free. It's not a happy ending per se, but it is hopeful, asserting that even the most horrific of thoughts and feelings can be overcome. For an author who so powerfully identified with violent impulses toward his loved ones, such a message would have been a great comfort. To quote King, In Jack Torrance, I saw a face that hypnotized me, because it was, to a large extent, my own. But when Stanley Kubrick saw that face, he saw a monster. Movie Jack lacks all the glimmers of kindness and love he was permitted in the novel. The car ride to the Overlook is not punctuated by shared laughter, but persistent frustration. There is no final, touching moment between father and son, and in fact the pair's only scene alone together prior to the climax is defined by Danny's fear in the face of his dad's creepy possessiveness and violent paranoia. There's no heartfelt I love you's between husband and wife. The only time Jack shows even the slightest hint of affinity for Wendy is in a scene where she waits on him hand and foot. And even here, he can't help but betray his irritation at her presence. And while Jack's violent temper and injuring of Danny's arm is revealed to us through Wendy early, as it is in the novel, there's little implication that Jack is in any way haunted by this act. He doesn't even acknowledge his abuse until Wendy accuses Jack of hurting Danny again, and even then, his acknowledgement seeks to dismiss his own violence rather than reckon with it. I did hurt him once, okay? It was an accident. Could have happened to anybody. King's critique that the film has no arc because it's clear from the start that Jack is already crazy is not wrong exactly, but it misses the point. Because while both works tell, broadly speaking, the same story, the horror of the novel is in identifying with your own potential to hurt your loved ones, that you could become an abuser. The horror of the film comes from being trapped with your abuser. And I can understand why that would hurt King. Kubrick's adaptation took the author's stand-in and transformed him from a good man troubled by evil to an evil man outright. Which is not to say the film version of Jack isn't also plagued by external forces and pressures. He too is targeted by the Overlook's ghosts, who indeed prey on his same weaknesses. Fear of failing as a man, personally and professionally, how these fears manifest in resentment for his family, and in addiction. Alcoholism is far less pervasive in the film than in the novel, but it is still an element of Jack's past, and the primary mechanism by which the Overlook successfully seduces him. But the book makes a firm distinction between Jack and these external pressures. Jack has bad thoughts, but it's alcohol, and then the supernatural power of the Overlook, that push him to act on those thoughts. This is especially evident in the climax, where King uses the pronoun it rather than he, him, to refer to Jack when possessed by the spirit of the Overlook, 
where Danny insists that this creature isn't really his daddy, and where the supernatural possesses Jack to mutilate his own face, literally and metaphorically destroying the man. Jack isn't really there. His body has just become a vessel for an external evil. Scary, perhaps, but there's also a measure of comfort in how King offloads responsibility. Jack isn't the bad guy, he too is a victim of the Overlook's evil. To underline the point, King also has the ghosts of the Overlook attempt to possess Dick Halloran after Jack has been killed, incepting thoughts that Danny is responsible for all this chaos, and the boy should die. Dick is able to ward off this influence, which may well speak to a greater strength of his character compared to Jack. But it also alleviates both men of responsibility for their violent impulses. It's the ghost's fault. Kubrick's The Shining does not grant this comfort. Alcoholism is an aspect of Jack's abusive past, but it does not define it. The powers of the Overlook do prompt Jack into murdering his family, but they do not literally possess his body and render the man little more than a puppet. He may be coerced into violence, but he chooses it all the same an extension of the rage and disdain he's expressed for his wife and son throughout. And while the film does observe the supernatural's effects on Danny and Wendy, only Jack is coerced into acting on its behalf. The Overlook doesn't make Jack evil, so much as it provides a setting where he will be rewarded for his abuse. This is part of the film's larger commentary on patriarchy, and specifically how patriarchy allows and enables abusive men. Consider the interview with Ullman. In the novel, this is an incredibly heated and fraught exchange, Ullman bluntly stating he does not like or trust Jack for the job, and Jack contemplating what an officious little prick Ullman is. But in the film, it's all smiles and pleasantries. Our people in Denver recommended Jack very highly, and for once, I agree with them. The world does not recoil in horror and suspicion from abusive men, as it does in King's novel. It opens up for them. Consider too how blatantly Danny's doctor can see Jack's abuse of the boy, but is powerless to intervene, and how the film cuts from the recognition of domestic abuse to the family's long car ride to the Overlook where the novel generates tension from whether Jack will be able to control his rage in this isolated environment, the film instead dwells on how Wendy and Danny will be trapped by an abuser who has been granted complete, unquestioned authority. In this context, the Overlook Hotel becomes an embodiment of patriarchy itself, a space wherein hurting his family will grant Jack yet more power and respect within the systems in place. Jack's final stage of evil is, in Robert Kolker's words, a demonic parody of the dutiful husband. Wendy, I'm home. There is a bit of a contradiction here, given Jack is still serving the bidding of a higher authority, and Jack's anguish in his nightmare of murdering his family does demonstrate the toll such urges have on the man but these contradictions are an inherent quality to patriarchy itself. The notion of man as provider may grant authority, but it also instills a pressure to live up to an idealized version of masculinity. Failure to adequately provide is internalized as a failure of manhood. Shoveling out driveways, working in a car wash, let me get that appeal to you. That patriarchal constructions of masculinity are bound by an unfeeling stoicism, often prevents men from expressing their sorrow and sadness, which instead manifest as anger. Notice Jack's clear pain at Wendy's accusation. You did this to him, didn't you? And his growing craving for alcohol. In my goddamn soul, just a glass of beer. It seems like Jack is about to weep, but instead the Overlook and patriarchy intervene. And what was sadness comes out instead as a torrent of bitter anger towards his wife. That bitch. As long as I live, 
She'll never let me forget what happened. And it was three goddamn years ago! King's The Shining also references the patriarchal pressure to succeed as a provider and how it spirals into violent rage. But his supernatural concepts are firmly grounded within the literal. All the novel's ghosts are given backstories, explaining who they were, how they died, and how their ghostly remnants correspond to their lives. Jack finds a scrapbook detailing the Overlook's history, and the hotel makes its desire for Danny explicit. His immense shining power can essentially serve as a battery for the Overlook's supernatural energies. Even Tony, Danny's imaginary friend and harbinger of the Overlook's horrors, is revealed to be an echo of Danny himself from the future. Kubrick maintains many of these concepts, but omits their explanation. This lack of context not only makes images like the Dogman an even greater shock to the system, it also encourages an engagement with the film's imagery rooted in symbolism and metaphor. To see the supernatural not strictly as a literal danger, as it is in the novel, but as an abstraction of the patriarchal influences which help push men into violence. And for all the ways Jack has been changed in adaptation, the changes to Wendy are just as significant. A far cry from the blonde bombshell and assertive personality King describes, Shelley Duvall plays the role as meek and mousy. While Book Wendy will criticize Jack for his drinking and abusive tendencies, her film counterpart is unable, or perhaps unwilling, to acknowledge her husband's violence until she is forced into a crisis moment. King has in fact been quite critical of the film's portrayal of Wendy, describing the movie version as one of the most misogynistic characters ever put to film, comparable to a screaming dish rag. I get what King is saying, especially in relation to his novel, where Wendy is far more willing to stand up to Jack, and generally demonstrates a confidence Duval's timidness does not. But this criticism misses some of the ways the film actually makes Wendy a stronger character than she is in the book. For starters, film Wendy is responsible for all the actual labor of the Overlook, while also performing domestic tasks like cooking and still finding time to play with her son. Jack never lifts a finger in any of these directions. Film Wendy is also more independent. In the book, Danny becomes a confidant to Wendy when Jack goes mad, someone to work out plans with and help carry them out. But in the film, Danny is in a near catatonic state following his attack in room 237, and Wendy is forced to protect her son's well-being, and her own, by herself. Crucial too, King's criticism of Wendy is itself colored by misogyny. This notion that because Wendy is a victim of abuse, she is somehow unworthy and even annoying. Why does she put up with Jack's cruelty? Why is she so subservient? Why doesn't she just leave him? Why is she acting like a victim? The critique puts the onus on Wendy for being abused, rather than Jack for being an abuser. This is also reflected in the novel, where an underlying source of terror for all three principal characters is if Wendy will leave Jack rather than Jack's violence in and of itself. For me, the defining Wendy scene, as characterized in the film, comes after Jack has screamed at her for suggesting they leave the hotel. Beaten and worn down, Wendy paces the room back and forth, rehearsing a confrontation with Jack, and that if he doesn't want to leave, then she and Danny will have to go by themselves. It's an intense scene, Wendy clearly exhausted and emotionally vulnerable struggling to maintain her composure in the face of her husband's violence and the malice which lies within the Overlook. But still, she takes the necessary steps to protect her family. Wendy may be utterly terrified, and she may need to psych herself up just to have a conversation with her husband, but by God, she's going to do it anyway. That's real strength to me. The differing perspectives of Kubrick and King culminate in each version of The Shining's respective ending. On the mere surface, King's building of emotional tension simmers to a boil, and the Overlook Hotel's literal explosion. 
Kubrick's colder, more precise style, meanwhile, concludes with a literal freezing. But on a deeper level, the two endings speak to different ways of conceptualizing evil. For King, evil may be horrifying, but it is also a defined external force, distinct from goodness. The father is redeemed, and evil is conquered. For Kubrick, evil is more pervasive, harder to separate and distinguish, and harder still to defeat. It might even be everlasting. There's a lot of debate about the significance of the film's final image, a photo of Jack amidst a 4th of July party in the Overlook, 1921. Perhaps this confirms Jack is in fact the reincarnation of the Overlook's previous caretaker, or maybe that his essence has been absorbed into the hotels. I see the meaning as less literal, but more an expression that the core violence of Jack, the Overlook, and the patriarchal societies the Overlook embodies are forever entwined. There is no direct source for either's evil, but they are circular forever feeding off each other. This is my rifle, this is my gun! This is for fighting, this is for fun! This is my rifle, this is my gun! This is for fighting, this is for fun! Where a populist bestseller like The Shining was atypical for Kubrick adaptation, The Short Timers is much more in line with the works he gravitated towards. A novel rooted in part in author Gustav Hasford's own experiences as a Marine, The Short Timers offered a detailed account of the Vietnam War, which provided a framework for Kubrick to explore the subject, but was also obscure enough that the director could comfortably deviate from the strict details of the text. Aspects of Hasford's writing also align strongly with Kubrick's sensibilities, not just the brutal violence and rather pessimistic attitude towards human nature, but the lack of external characterization. None of Hasford's marines are given backstories, an omission Kubrick maintains, and in fact enhances by removing what few details were granted in the novel. His characters are instead defined by their behavior within their current setting more so than any notions of past. But I suspect what most attracted Kubrick to Hasford's writing is the emphasis on training the process of how men are turned into soldiers, and in effect, into killing machines. This transformation is at the forefront of both what Kubrick maintains from Hosford and what he changes. The novel is divided into three sections, which effectively boil down to boot camp, war correspondence, and active combat. And while Kubrick pulls from the latter two sections rather loosely, he is remarkably faithful to the first. The Spirit of the Bayonet is the shortest third of the short timers, less a narrative than a summary of Private Joker's experiences as a trainee at Paris Island, but in it is a clear picture of Kubrick's adaptation. The drill sergeant who debases the recruits with verbal and physical assault, the fetishistic descriptions for guns, even the admiration for the exquisite marksmanship of ex-marines Charles Whitman and Lee Harvey Oswald, all comes directly from the book. The central narrative and emotional throughline is not Joker himself, but the overweight country bumpkin, whose slowness to learn marine ways draws targeted abuse from his drill sergeant. In the book, his name is Leonard Pratt. In the movie, it's Leonard Lawrence. But in both cases, the sergeant opts for Gomer Pyle, named after the slow-witted buffoon of the Andy Griffith show. The sergeant's abuse is eventually joined by Leonard's comrade. Angry they are punished for his mistakes, and willing to beat him into shape. Arguably, it works. Leonard does in fact become a killing machine, hollow and unfeeling, as he turns his weapon against his abuser, and then himself. No! Kubrick does not really change this material so much as he expands it. The Blanket Party, which takes up merely a paragraph in the novel, has become a two-minute set piece, with Kubrick devoting almost a full 30 seconds to Leonard's screams of anguish and Joker's efforts to block them out. 
The sergeant's emasculating insults have become Shakespearean sonnets of vulgarity under the improvisation of Arlie Ermey. I bet you're the kind of guy that would f a person in the ass and not even have the goddamn common courtesy to give him a reach around. I'll be watching you. In the book, in the lead up to his murder suicide, Leonard's speech is erratic, volatile, and emotional. But in the movie, his words are precise and focused. Less concerned with the sexual appeal of his rifle than he is its capacity to kill. Man rendered into killing machine. This process begins in the film's opening, a montage where the Paris Island recruits have their heads shaved, set to Johnny Wright's pro-Vietnam war anthem, Hello Vietnam. This scene is a cinematic creation, both a metaphor for the loss of humanity and individuality the men will be subjected to, and literally the beginning of that loss. The sequence visualizes a paradox from Joker's internal monologue, that the Marines supposedly do not want robots. The Marine Corps wants killers. The Marine Corps wants to build indestructible men. Yet they seek to build men, as if they were machines, to be without choice. Even the change in title is relevant to this theme. The short timers refers to the men, specifically those nearing the end of their military service. A full metal jacket is a type of ammunition where the soft core of a bullet is encased in an outer shell of a harder metal. An outer shell which subsumes softness, to make for more efficient killing. Though Kubrick's film can technically be broken down into the same thirds as the book, the popular perception of Full Metal Jacket is a movie split in two. Boot Camp and Vietnam. Once the narrative shifts, Kubrick begins deviating from the text. There are broad similarities. Joker is still our protagonist, at first a war correspondent, before eventually being moved to a squad led by Private Cowboy, a comrade from boot camp, and other major characters like Rafter Man and Animal Mother are also carried over, mostly intact from the novel. But Kubrick is far less faithful to the details of the book's later sections. Marines no longer mock the dishonesty of John Wayne's The Green Berets, but become movie stars themselves, performing for the cameras and reproducing the dynamics of Hollywood genre. Bits of dialogue have been repurposed. Joker's internal monologue about living in a world of shit and the Marines singing along to the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse theme song have been moved to the very end of the film and combined into a single scene. Who's the leader of the club that's made for you and me? M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E -E Gone entirely are Vietnamese jungles, Kubrick's action instead unfolding in war-torn cityscapes, the largest example being the climactic battle against the Viet Cong sniper in the ruins of Hue, a composite of two sniper battles from the novel. The culmination of the sequence is Joker's execution of the sniper, revealed to be a teenage girl. In the book, this killing occurs at the midpoint of the story, a defining point in the deterioration of Joker's humanity and a stepping stone to his role as squad leader that the story concludes with. In the film, this killing is the penultimate scene of the movie, and the end point of Joker's character arc. Again we see Kubrick underlining the transformation from man to killing machine. Murder is not a part of the journey, as it is for Hasford, but the destination in and of itself. Killing the young sniper completes the circle which had started in the opening. Moving the execution to the ending also gives the film a parallel structure that the book lacks. For all the criticism that Full Metal Jacket is a movie of unequal halves which never really coalesce, the bisected narratives do in fact parallel, both stories of men who are slowly broken down until they become capable of killing. It is, of course, not a perfect reflection. Most obviously, Joker survives his transformation in a way Leonard does not, but more broadly, the film's second half is looser than its first. While time at Paris Island is laser-focused on the abusive discipline of marine hierarchy, each scene building to the inevitable confrontation between Leonard and Hartman, 
Scenes in Vietnam have more of a rambling, episodic quality. Joker bounces from different settings without clear focus, until he and his squad defeat the sniper who had killed three of their men. And the film ends with little having actually been accomplished. Even as Joker completes his arc, having finally become a killer, there is little sense of closure. The film denies payoff, and this is very much by design. The boot camp movie is a genre which often doubles as a coming of age story. Boys are sent to basic training, where they are subjected to the discipline of a hardened drill instructor. He is harsh, even cruel, but his training prepares recruits for the horrors of combat, and they are finally able to emerge as men. The object of the exercise is to turn boys into men, and men into marines. Full Metal Jacket knowingly recreates these tropes, Hartman attacking the boys' masculinity so they can prove themselves real men by becoming brothers in arms. The concluding execution seals the ritual. Michael Purcell argues the scene is presented in overtly sexual terms. The victim lies on the floor, gasping with pain in an obscene parody of sexual excitement, while men stand around and watch. When Joker asks what they should do with her, Animal responds. Fuck her. And so, Joker does the way a Marine should. The scene is both a literal murder and a metaphorical assault, dual conquests which affirm Joker's masculinity. But Kubrick also exposes the lies at the heart of this affirmation. Becoming a man, as defined through the paradigms of sex and violence, is not a triumph of resilience or a testament to one's inner strength. It is a corrosion of the soul. Such a corrosion completely destroys Leonard. Unless we think he's simply too weak to hack it as a marine, the film also stews in the failure of Cowboy Squad in Hue, dismantled by one little girl with a rifle in a perched tower. When Joker's M16 jams, he doesn't respond with grace under pressure, but frenzied panic, only surviving thanks to Rafter Man and the sheer numbers of the squad overwhelming the girl. The hazing rituals do not produce better soldiers, but compliant killing machines, fed into a meat grinder of violent horror. Three men die to kill one teenager in a city already blasted into oblivion. That the full scope of the Vietnam material does not really coalesce is precisely the point. The order and control of boot camp is a lie. The war zone is pure chaos, devoid of meaning. The boys don't become men, they remain children, singing along to Mickey Mouse as the world burns around them. But amid this despair, Kubrick also adds a glimmer of hope absent in Hasford's novel. In both works, Joker is assigned to help teach Leonard and improve his performance as a trainee. In the book, this help makes little difference. But in the film, Leonard does begin to demonstrably improve. He doesn't exactly become a model soldier, but a montage does show Leonard succeeding at tasks he'd previously failed at, following Joker's tutelage. He still makes mistakes, like the unlocked footlocker and snuck donut which brings Hartman's wrath. But remember, the film takes time to note Joker's mistakes too. Sir, the private six general! Sir, the private has been instructed, but he does not know, sir! You slimy scumbag, get on your face and give me 25! Sir, aye aye, sir! There is no perfect soldier, but kindness, empathy, and camaraderie produce a strength and competency Hartman's abuses cannot. Notice, too, this early scene where Leonard falls, and the instinct of the other men to help. Such kindness is ultimately poisoned by Hartman turning the recruits against Leonard, a gesture which stings all the more given Joker's betrayal. But this addition to Hasford's novel glimpses a healthy form of masculine bonding, which stands in stark contrast to the competitive posturing military discipline enforces. The last detail and adaptation I want to talk about relates to Joker himself. Across book and film, Joker is defined by his ironic detachment, 
and the ways in which Vietnam's violent horrors come to haunt and consume Joker's mind. For Hasford, the emphasis is primarily on the latter, with the book generally fixating on grotesque expressions of violence. Kubrick's violence, though impactful, is far less vulgar, with the director more interested in Joker's ironic qualities. His peace symbol, which comes from the book, is counterpointed by the phrase, born to kill. Joker's witticisms, his attempts at satirical comedy toward the Vietnam War, are not just internal monologue, as they are for Hosford, but vocalized repeatedly. I wanted to meet interesting and stimulating people of an ancient culture and kill them. I wanted to be the first kid on my block to get a confirmed kill. I can't help but see the character as something of a stand-in for Kubrick himself, a man who relied on detached irony and humor to understand the darkest forms of systematized violence. Full Metal Jacket is, in essence, a continuation of Dr. Strangelove, both films using black comedy to address the horrors of war. But Full Metal Jacket's oscillations in tone are even more severe. Hartman's barbed insults are so intricately crafted, so creative, and so absurd that you can't help but laugh. Did your parents have any children that lived? Sir, yes, sir. I bet they regret that. You're so ugly you could be a modern art masterpiece. It's a funny movie, until the implied violence becomes explicit, and the film snaps back to a deadly serious horror. And just as the film's comedy gives way to despair, Joker's ironic detachment slowly erodes as the man becomes overwhelmed by the abyss he's forced to reckon with. Dark humor and a satirical bite are insufficient for understanding such a senseless waste of life. I find it rather telling that, both before and after Full Metal Jacket, Kubrick was developing a movie about the Holocaust, even finishing a screenplay before abandoning the project. There are a couple different theories as to why Kubrick dropped the idea, but his wife Christiana has claimed Stanley simply struggled with the sheer violence and inhumanity of the subject matter. How can I even film it? How can you even pretend it? Kubrick's final film would mark a notable shift away from large-scale physical violence and toward a more intimate cruelty. After exploring the mysteries of the cosmos in 2001, Kubrick took aim at the mysteries of marriage, probed in Arthur Schnitzler's 1926 novella Dream Story. Though it would ultimately take Kubrick another 30 years to adapt the material, Eyes Wide Shut would emerge remarkably faithful to its source. The setting has been moved from 1920s Vienna to 1990s New York, a shift which brings a trove of cultural changes, all names have been altered, a carnival ball has become a Christmas party, tuberculosis updated to HIV, but the basic plotting and characters have been preserved. A doctor and his wife share separate, sexually suggestive conversations at a party, the next day observes their routines at work and at home, before an evening fight over last night's flirtations stirs jealousy and contempt. The wife confesses to an unspoken lust a sexual fantasy over a sailor that had consumed her one year prior when the family vacationed together. Overtaken with resentment, the doctor is summoned to see a patient, prompting an evening odyssey of near-miss sexual encounters, with patients, a sex worker, and the young daughter of a costume shop owner, all culminating in a secret society mansion or... Uh... Cuddle. Y yes, cuddle that the doctor infiltrates, before he is discovered and cast out. The next morning sees the doctor re-pursue these erotic leads, each ending in disappointment, until the story concludes with an uneasy reconciliation between husband and wife. Kubrick mirrors Schnitzler rather closely. Even the scene where our good doctor is accosted on the street by some young ruffians comes from the book. 
Granted, this attack is also a key insight into one of the major changes Kubrick makes, the erasure of the protagonist's implied Jewishness. Though it is never explicitly stated, Dream Story's Friedeloin is suggested to be Jewish, both in how aspects of his biography mirror Schnitzler's, who was himself Jewish, and in this brief glimpse of aggression, the young men who shove Friedeloin linked to an anti-Semitic fraternity. The film removes this coding, Bill Hartford instead an unambiguous wasp type, right down to the casting of all-American movie star Tom Cruise. Jeffrey Cox argues that the film does still hint at anti-Semitism in the attack, with the Yale shirts and jackets echoing the novella's anti-Semitic fraternity, but the more explicit bigotry on display is homophobia, the men yelling homophobic slurs at Cruz. I don't know why the Jewish-raised Kubrick decided to omit hints of Jewishness and Eyes Wide Shut, nor do I feel comfortable speculating on such matters, but the omission does lead to some profound changes to the source material, even if the plot is maintained. Though the inciting incident of the book is spurred by jealousy and unfulfilled sexual fantasy, the arc of the narrative is concerned more broadly with Frida Loin's status as an outsider. As a doctor in Vienna, Frida Loin is a person of some importance and power, and is even wealthy enough to afford housekeepers to take care of his domestic space. But his late-night odyssey in search of sex is essentially a series of humbling episodes. This is most overt in the continued denial of sexual completion and the attack from the anti-Semites, but more crucial still is Friedeloin's discovery of a secret society, a glimpse into another world that, even by Novella's end, he has no access to. Despite his accomplishments and pedigree, there are halls of power that Friedeloin can never be a part of. Schnitzler never explicitly states that Friedeloin's Jewishness is what marks him an outsider, but that identity does inform the subtext in a way that is unique to the novella. Bill, on the other hand, is aligned far more with the wealthy elites than Friedeloin ever was. Kubrick underlines this point at the Christmas party where Bill is so ingratiated within high society that he covers the near-fatal overdose of a young woman for his rich friend Ziegler. Bill does not merely discover a world of corruption, but actively participates in one from the start. Money is in fact essential to how Eyes Wide Shut defines its protagonist, and how Bill defines himself. While the opening shot voyeuristically spies on Alice undressing from afar, the first line of dialogue betrays the true focus of the movie. Honey, do you see my wallet? Money is both the primary tool by which Bill seeks to enact a sexual revenge against his wife, and a point of pride, that he can pay for any and everything. The Christmas setting reinforces this theme. So much of the film's visual aesthetic is defined by the ghostly glow of Christmas lights and seasonal iconography. But the holiday is only ever discussed in transactional terms. Which presents have been purchased, and which still need to be. The only Christmas tradition the Hartford family engages in is shopping, where daughter Helena runs wild through the store, as her distant parents trail behind. The boundaries of the film's milieu are defined by money, and when Bill can't simply buy his way through a problem, he flashes his medical board card, like a cop flashing his badge, licensed to access a world unavailable to the unwashed rubes. But despite seemingly being an avatar for societal elites, Bill nonetheless endures the same humiliations as Friedeloin. Just as Kubrick used Ziegler, a character who has no analog in Schnitzler's novella, to underline Bill's alignment with societal elites in the film's opening, so too does he use Ziegler to underline Bill's distance from that world in the film's climax. Where Friedeloin's investigations into the strange night before merely turn up a series of dead ends, which prompts Friedeloin to give up his inquiries, Bill is summoned to Ziegler's home, where Ziegler reveals himself part of the secret society Bill had infiltrated. In a speech that is both revealing and withholding, 
reassuring, yet terrifying, Ziegler attempts to put Bill's mind at ease by claiming there was no real danger, while also firmly stating that he's glimpsed a world he cannot understand and should not trifle with. If I told you their names, I'm not going to tell you their names, but if I did, I don't think you'd sleep so well. For all Bill's money, status, charm, and privilege, there is still a clear delineation between himself and the true powers which govern the world. The film is vague about explicitly naming who those powers are, but given it's a cab ride and a rented costume that give Bill away, along with the running motif of class and money that runs through the entirety of Eyes Wide Shut, it's fair to conclude the answer is the ultra-wealthy. Where Dream Story was, for Frida Loin, a reminder that he is still an outsider despite his pretenses of upper-class sophistication, for Bill, it's a revelation. Like Barry Lyndon, Bill tries so carefully to craft an image of class and affluence, to believe himself an authority with the power to shape his destiny, only for the bounds of his own power to be so firmly stated by story's end. Eyes Wide Shut hints at this discrepancy between protagonist and his setting in its mise-en-scene, particularly the artifice of the film's New York City. Created on sound stages in London, and with techniques as old-fashioned as rear-screen projection, Kubrick's vision of his former home is an uncanny meld of the highly detailed and the obviously phony. Great care was taken to recreate the look and feel of the city streets, from the newsstands to the stone, and yet it never fully convinces as an illusion. It's always clear we're looking at a set. Martin Scorsese has described the effect as akin to a half-remembered version of New York from a dream. This is certainly consistent with Bill's dreamlike odyssey through the evening, as it is for Frida Loin in the novella, but it also communicates the disharmony between Bill and his environment, that the character's supposedly assured place is in fact incongruous, even unstable. The instability of class and self-worth is tinged in Eyes Wide Shut with a heavy dose of wounded masculinity. This is also an element of dream story, but Kubrick accentuates its sting, first by reconfiguring the conflict of the narrative. Christiana Kubrick described dream story as a book about mutual jealousy, a shared compulsion between husband and wife to hurt each other. Case in point, after Friedeloin's wife shares her fantasy about the sailor, Friedeloin recalls how, on that same vacation, he lustfully gazed upon a teenager he shared the beach with one morning. Conversation between husband and wife reveals the unspoken desires both have felt outside their marriage, and this even-handedness does not extend to eyes wide shut. True, it's Alice's suspicions of Bill's flirtations from the prior evening that prompts their fight, but Bill has no retort to her fantasy. Unlike Frida Loin, the doctor does not go into the night after sharing an uncomfortable truth with his wife, but genuinely dumbfounded his wife has ever had sexual urges about anyone other than him. This is also what gives Eyes Wide Shut an understated comedy lacking in the novella. That such emotional damage, soul-searching, and uncovering of a sinister secret society all spur from a man learning his wife sometimes gets turned on by other guys is frankly hilarious. Initial criticisms that the film reflected a conservative, even chaste attitude towards sex miss how that's precisely the point. Eyes Wide Shut is not a steamy erotic thriller in the vein of Joe Esterhaz. It's a story about a sexually repressed and inexperienced person fumbling through newly introduced carnal possibilities. What do you want to do? Well, what do you recommend? To go back to the opening shot, the voyeuristic gaze as Alice undresses is itself a joke of sorts. The film teases you with the possibilities of eroticism, all the more charged given the focus is a real-life tabloid marriage, only for the next scene to reveal the limits of Bill's gaze. Is my hair okay? 
It's great. You're not even looking at it. The sexually charged Odyssey to Follow is a series of near-miss encounters. As Michael Kurowski so effectively summarizes, there is no orgasm in store for Bill. The most vivid depictions of carnal acts are Bill's angry fixations on his fantasy cuckolding, and at the mansion, where all Bill can do is gaze upon the unbridled hedonism with detached horror. Kubrick, by extension, looks upon Bill with a certain detachment. This is one of the few Kubrick films not to feature any form of voiceover, or even title cards to help provide structure and context. The recurring flashes of Bill imagining his wife's desired affair offer glimpses of his interiority, but they are brief and fleeting. This is in contrast to Dream Story, which, though written in the third person, nonetheless offers ample insight into Frida Loin's perspective. Schnitzler situates the reader within his protagonist's impotent rage, but Kubrick steps outside of it, employing enough distance to see the comical qualities of Bill's predicament. Eyes Wide Shut may have the tone of a dream, but its frequent use of an objective perspective and its withdrawn hero make clear that it is not Bill's dream. A difference in perspective can also be sensed in Eyes Wide Shut's ending, which mirrors dream stories on the surface, but carries different implications. The second half of both works is marked by disillusionment. Efforts to follow up on the prior evening's mysteries or flirtations conclude in either untied loose ends or sobering realities. The husband ultimately confesses to his activities from the prior night, and an uneasy reconciliation is made between husband and wife. Kubrick, even in adding the climactic scene with Ziegler, is faithful to this narrative, and even lifts entire lines from Schnitzler for the final scene between Bill and Alice. And no dream is ever just a dream. We're awake now. But this couple's conclusion is far more complicated than Frida Loin and Albertine's. If the second half of both Dream Story and Eyes Wide Shut is defined by a feeling of waking from a long, strange dream, then Dream Story's ending retreats back into the dream. This is both literal, as the ending occurs with Frida Loin and Albertine in bed together, but also in the poetry of the novella's final, triumphant lines. Schnitzler's last paragraph offers simple rumination on the bliss and beauty of domesticity. Eyes Wide Shut, meanwhile, remains firmly planted in reality. Husband and wife don't lie together in bed, but tour a shopping mall, still trapped in a world of commerce and transactions. Love provides no insulation from that reality, and love itself remains strained. Returning to domesticity is less for bliss or beauty than it is the safety of what is known, what is familiar. And perhaps the starkest difference is verbal. There's no poetry to conclude Eyes Wide Shut, but instead, the bluntest exchange imaginable. There is something very important that we need to do as soon as possible. What's that? Fuck. That the final word in Stanley Kubrick's filmography is a solitary F-bomb is inherently amusing. This is a director who has taken us to the infinite and beyond, to the unknowable horrors of ancient pasts, to the brink of nuclear Armageddon, and then past it. How does it all end? Fuck. But this is a fitting end for a director so preoccupied with the psychosexual throughout his career. It is also in Kidman's quiet, even gentle delivery, eye-opening. Rather than drifting into abstraction or sentiment, the film concludes with a simple, honest expression of what is needed to maintain this marriage. In classic Kubrickian style, there is an understated comedy at play. That's all the funnier, given the extreme places this story has taken us. But also a sincerity. Husband and wife are now awake, and they love each other. Maybe not forever, but certainly for now. And they know what they need to do. 
It certainly isn't as romantic or enchanting as Schnitzler's ending, but in its own blunt way, I think it's just as hopeful. Why did Stanley Kubrick adapt so many books? According to his Shining co-writer Diane Johnson, Kubrick liked working with pre-existing source material because he felt it easier to examine the structure and effects of a work as an outsider looking in. That emphasis on structure is evident throughout these adaptations. As early as The Killing, we see how essential a tightly wound narrative was to Kubrick's work. And from 2001 on, that structure would only grow firmer. The latter half of Kubrick's filmography is marked by symmetrical storytelling and clearly delineated sections. Adaptation provided Kubrick the materials to apply this structure, even when the work itself didn't literally follow the same organizing principles. The Luck of Barry Lyndon does not follow Kubrick's preferred symmetrical design at all, and is in fact a rambling series of largely self-flattering anecdotes from the titular character, until the 11th hour, where his world suddenly falls apart. But Kubrick could take these narrative beats and rearrange them into a bisected epic, recognizably still Barry Lyndon, but with changes to tone, perspective, and meaning. This balance of fidelity and alteration is at the core of Kubrickian adaptation. For a filmmaker known for dramatically diverging from the text, Kubrick was largely faithful to his sources. I was consistently surprised throughout this series by just how closely the films would stick to the events of the novel. Even when completely changing the tone or setting, even when drawing the undying rage of Stephen King, the source material is still recognizably present. The adaptation which marks the most radical departure is actually Spartacus, the one Kubrick had the least to do with. This is not to suggest that Kubrick's genius was simply in picking good books to bring to the screen, but that he had sharp instincts for pinpointing the core themes and significance of a piece of literature, and how to best extract that on film. Often that meant reinterpreting ideas through a visual medium, or altering the details to more strongly coalesce around a core idea. But just as often, it also meant streamlining the details to craft a better entertainment. For all his artistry and daring, Kubrick remained, until his death, a Hollywood filmmaker, and he did care about pleasing an audience. This is evident in broad strokes. With the exception of Eyes Wide Shut, all of Kubrick's films fall within well-worn Hollywood genres, but also in the specifics. Condensing two sniper battles into one makes for far more efficient pacing and less repetitive set pieces. Refusing the Torrances any leave from the Overlook Hotel once they've arrived enhances the horror of isolation. Adding the performance of a young German singer provides a reprieve and release from the violence of an uncaring war machine. Turning the sparse, deadly serious nuclear thriller Red Alert into a gut-bustingly funny comedy may well have been motivated by a belief that satire could more effectively communicate the inherent absurdity in mutually assured destruction, but it also transforms a dry and boring narrative into something far more fun and inviting. This instinct to entertain sometimes backfired. Removing Alex's most heinous crimes to make for a more palatable protagonist distorts A Clockwork Orange's moral alignment. Simplifying Lolita's nickname erases the significance of how Dolores is robbed of her agency and sense of self, even in something as simple as her name. But at their best, Kubrick's alterations could build upon the source, resulting in refined narratives, sharper thematic insights, and more potent genre exercises. That much of Kubrick's sources were themselves largely obscure or lesser known works is essential to how the filmmaker was able to build upon their foundations. It's rather telling that the biggest exception to this obscurity, Lolita, is also Kubrick's weakest adaptation. That's not to say the film is bad, I think it's quite good, but Nabokov's book is so fully defined by the medium of the novel that trying to adapt the material to film is to some extent an exercise in futility. 
For all of the movie's strengths, Kubrick is trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. His richest adaptations came from less successful novels, books which were imperfect, but put forth interesting ideas, or scenarios, or thematic insights that could be mined for the cinema. This is the genius of Stanley Kubrick's adaptations. While largely faithful to his sources, the text is not, in and of itself, a sacred thing, but a starting point for cinematic invention. Merely bringing a facsimile of a book from page to screen is insufficient. The goal of adaptation is that the source material fuels the creativity of a new work, whether that means maintaining the original ingredients or transforming them. In that respect, Stanley Kubrick did rely on adaptation. It would not be controversial to say Kubrick's filmography would be infinitely lesser without the various source materials he drew from. But just as Kubrick benefited from these works, so too did the works benefit from Kubrick. Beyond the increased visibility, which comes from attachment to one of the cinema's premier auteurs, the concepts and ideas explored in these books saw expansion, elaboration, and complication in the adaptations of Stanley Kubrick. Whether one prefers the adaptations, or the novels and novellas which inspired them, is a matter of taste. But to examine the full scope of Kubrick's filmography is to see how cinema can work in collaboration with literature, rather than in servitude to it.